the Nazi search for the Holy Grail. Looking at that and so much more today. Every culture that has ever existed in the world has had their share of weird superstitions, crazy myths, religious dogmas that many find strange and fantastical. Nazi Germany, certainly no exception. The Nazis had a very, um, a typical worldview, very strange and, you know, pretty fucking horrible vision of how the world should look. And also, as it turns out, pretty delusional view of how the world used to look. Also, uh, especially racist, went to great lengths to prove that their racism was rational, scientifically based. Racism is certainly not unique to the Nazis. Racism has been around for many, many centuries. It has existed in various forms all around the world, continues to exist. But few have been as racist, or at least as uniquely racist as the Nazis. Their vision for an Aryan world was based in a belief in Aryan superiority. And to rationalize this belief, they developed a number of very strange theories about what it meant to be Aryan. Their strange beliefs opened the door to even stranger beliefs. And pretty soon, just about any half-baked, crazy, mythological, or folklore-based idea that pointed to Aryans being the master race or to the existence of some type of magic or magical item or occult secret that could help the Aryans win World War II seemed possibly legit. In their lust for world domination, in their quest for what they considered racial purity, the Nazis traveled around the globe to find a number of mythical and supernatural items, like the Holy Grail that they thought would give them an advantage over their enemies as they attempted to conquer the world. They believed that possessing these magical items would prove that the Aryans were indeed the master race, the race destined to control the world. To prove the superiority of Aryans, the Nazis even tried to prove that modern Aryans are the descendants of ancient gods, the descendants of Atlantis, the descendants of actual giants who could speak telepathically and fly around and do other cool, not at all possible shit. From talking battle strategy or taking battle strategy advice from psychics and astrologers to the hunt for the lost city of Atlantis. And of course, again, the Holy Grail, the Nazis were very into what they called border science, which is a lot like real science, except you get to make up everything and reinterpret actual science to fit any idiotic and or hateful agenda or narrative you want to spread. Got a lot of wackadoodle to dig into today. It's going to be a weird one. A lot of dumb Nazi beliefs. I look forward to mocking today on this. I, I, I'm sorry, what the shit did you just say? Edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> Happy Monday, me Tex. I'm Dan Cummins, a.k.a. Damn Suckins, a.k.a. Grandmaster Suck, a.k.a. the Suck Master, the Master Sucker, Santa's Stocking Sucker. And that last one is particularly weird. Uh, hail Nimrod, hail sweet, sexy Lucifina. I, I want her around today. I don't, I don't want to say be gone. Maybe she's wearing some red fishnets in honor of the holiday season. Yes, please. Uh, praise good boy Bojangles. Glory be to Grammy winner and Triple M. Uh, can you believe that next week is Christmas week? Only a few more Mondays, and then we're on to the next decade. Gosh damn. Uh, thanks for all the ratings and reviews. The overall podcast landscape gets more competitive every week. Crazy how many podcasts are out there. Uh, those ratings and reviews help across, you know, all platforms. A good rating or review, the best gift you can give us. Next to telling your friends, social media followers, family, et cetera, to listen. Just maybe don't tell David Icke. Talked about him a lot on the Patreon Secret Suck. I would rather he not find out. I think. Or maybe that would be the best. Maybe that'd be a lot of fun and good publicity. You know what? Go ahead and tell him. It'd be great to tell him. Uh, now let's talk about merch. Uh, listen up, wrestling fans. Monday, Monday, Monday. We've got the wrestling shirt of the century. The Chikatilo Winter Wrestling Academy. Grappling, flopping, sliding, rolling, hopping, gliding. The amazing Andre versus Ed, the neck camper. Let's get ready to rumble, mother. Black Bella Tribal made out of 1 million percent wrestling. Oh, that's always fun. It's always fun. Uh, <laughs> I, love, I love doing that voice. Also, just in time for the holidays, the Lucifina windbreaker, been restocked. Hail Lucifina. And finally, patches. We got some patches. Four new patches. Oh, my heck. Mother. I love my cult. Good boy Bojangles. Uh, we have those three additional patches uh, only for the Space Lizards. All patches made out of 100% patch fabric and also 100% buttons and castles. Space Lizards get that. Yeah, you guys get it. Uh, also, uh, working on changing how merch is shopped and shipped out this next year. I'll have more details the next few weeks, but Access Apparel, a.k.a. Spicy Club. Still be doing the designs. Thank Nimrod. 
Merch will be now be distributed, though, or here soon, will be distributed by a giant corporation with a dedicated customer service staff, a company based in Cleveland, which I like, Queen of the Sucks, hometown. Uh, they got more printing pre presses, dedicated delivery staff, direct-to-garment printing options, and more. Uh, the cult has grown. We've had some growing pains. Uh, thank Nimrod for that. Uh, we've been brainstorming for quite some time about how to keep more items in stock, have more consistent delivery times, faster online customer service, but still be able to do the fun little niche specialty items that we like to do. Like the robes and other odd items. How can we stay niche? But, you know, because our customer base has grown, uh, have customer service more on par with something like a, uh, you know, something that like a big company like Amazon could provide. Just want you to know that we've been working brainstorm behind the scenes for a couple months and, and coming up with some new organizational systems that will roll out before that much longer. And uh, that'll allow me to focus more on content, uh, allow you as a, as a customer, if you're getting the merch, to get stuff, uh, you know, uh, more consistently when you want it, have more things in stock. Yeah, it's just going to be uh, hopefully a, a, a big improvement on something that I think is already really good. So just want to share that. And uh, last stand-up tour dates of the year uh, in the city where my stand-up life began. Spokane, Washington. Tickets selling fast for shows on Thursday, the 26th, Friday, the 27th. Two shows on Saturday, December 28th. Later this week, announcing dates for my Toxic Thoughts 2020 stand-up tour. Check out dancummins.tv, at Dan Cummins Comedy on Instagram and Facebook, please. For those dates, Sacramento, Brooklyn, Huntington Beach, St. Louis, Salt Lake City, Nashville, Philadelphia, Honolulu, Hawaii, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio. Atlanta, San Francisco, Boston, Cleveland, Jacksonville, Oklahoma City, Loveland, Colorado, and so much more. Those were all just in the first half of the year. Some tickets on sale already. Some will be on sale soon. Already working on several new stories that were not written yet when I recorded my last special just outside Detroit in October. And hopefully that'll be out, uh, you know, in, uh, in the spring. Uh, thanks for supporting the stand-up. I love it. No live time sucks in 2020, though. Sorry. I love doing them. But I took on too much in 2019. I damn near burned myself out. Sleep deprivation. I'm touring a bit less overall this next year. I have more help in the Suck Dungeon. Trying to get more efficient. Get better at Time Suck. Better at Stand Up. Better at The Secret Suck. Better at Scared to Death. Spend more time with the wife and kids and dogs before I add anything else to my plate. May do Live Sucks again at some point. But right now, focus in my road performance energy solely on Stand Up. August 2020 will be my 20-year Stand Up anniversary. And I want to be the best I've ever been. I know that was a lot. That was a lot. We're doing a lot here. Thank you for listening. Now let's get into some crazy. Oh man, this was a fun one. Holy fucking wackadoodle. Uh, today is a weird suck. And one of my favorite sucks thus far, it's a Nazi search for the Holy Grail time. The dark cult of Nazism, especially at its inner core, was real, real weird. Nazis would decide that it was a good idea to hunt for the fabled city of Atlantis to look for an entrance to the hollow earth and to try and find mythical items like the, you know, Spear of Destiny. They would also search for uh, real items as well, like the Ghent altarpiece, because they thought it contained a, a secret map to a magical place. To understand the Nazi motivation for all of this, we must first understand Nazi beliefs about the origins of the Aryan race, because that, that really is why they were looking for all this other stuff, you know? They wanted to prove they were superior to all the other races. This belief in Aryan supremacy would fuel their desire to search for all the other stuff. I had no idea this space lizard voted in topic would send me and the team into wormholes where I ended up learning so much about, uh, you know, what the Nazis thought it meant to be Aryan. I had no idea. So glad I, I know now. Hope you'll be glad too. Uh, Adolf Hitler, the German Charles Manson, if Manson would have been a, a teeny tiny bit more mentally stable and would have had way more followers, twisted the theories of archaeologist Gustav Cosina to assert that Aryans were a master race of Indo-Europeans. Hitler's Aryans were Nordic in appearance and directly ancestral to the Germans and that they were, uh, they were responsible for every cool thing that has ever happened in the world and more. Uh, the Nazi Aryan myth goes something like this. Around 1700 BCE, these Aryans, an ancient group of people whose actual origins, I'll, I'll uh, go over here shortly, invaded the ancient urban civilizations of the Indus Valley, present-day India and Pakistan, and destroyed their cultures and built a new superior culture. These Indus Valley civilizations, also known as uh, Harappa or uh, Sarasvati, Sarasvati had a written language uh, farming capabilities, what could only be described as a very advanced for the time culture and civilization, and then they were crushed by the Aryans, at least in Hitler's mind. 
And these invading, ass-kicking Aryans were super white, a bunch of super white, blue-eyed, ripped, borderline superheroes kicking ass where modern-day India and Pakistan now sit. Uh, makes total sense, you know, that, that white people settled that area long ago. Because, I mean, if you've ever met someone from India or Pakistan, you can really see the Aryan features right away, right? The blonde hair, the blue eyes, the fair skin, all cultural kind of trademarks of Pakistani and Indian peoples. I mean, just watch a Bollywood movie and, and you'll get it. You know, you'll think, for fuck's sake, do you ever cast anyone who isn't white, blue-eyed, with Nicole Kidman colored, super white, like printer paper white skin? My God, can just maybe one person Maybe just have a little more melanin, hazel eyes, raven black hair. Where's this movie set, Sweden? We all know I'm being sarcastic, right? Okay, good. Moving along. Some 1,200 years after the supposed Aryan Indian invasion, the descendants of these Aryans, again in Hitler's mind, wrote the classic Indian literature called the Vedas, the oldest scriptures of Hinduism. These allegedly Nordic invaders were defined as looking directly opposite to native South Asian peoples called Dravidians, who were supposed to have uh, been super uh, or have been much, you know, darker skinned. But is Hitler's belief true? Well, of course not. He was a maniac when it came to racial beliefs. He was a true wackadoodle. Uh, This shit was believed by some late 19th century, early 20th century archaeologists, still believed by many wackadoodle pseudo-historians, pseudo-archaeologists online today, uh, now believed by no one taken seriously in the archaeological or historical community. It wasn't until the late 19th and early 20th centuries that that the word Aryan even became equated on any level with Germanic or Nordic peoples. Outside of Nazi speak, Aryan is not a race. One of the many sources we used for this suck, an article on thoughtcode.com states that Aryan is probably one of the most misused and abused words ever to come out of the field of linguistics. Prior to the recent corruption, Aryan referred to an archaic language whose speakers based originally in present-day Iran, Pakistan, and India a language spoken by people thought to have spread and influenced other languages throughout the Indian subcontinent a few thousand years ago. Aryan-speaking Middle Eastern people traded, procreated with people already living on the Indian subcontinent, people who did not kick the shit out of them and take over, or they did not kick the shit out of and take over. Uh, It's a myth so prevalent, it's even listed in many a dictionary today under the definition of Aryan. Had to look at a lot of sources to untangle this linguistic historical mess today. Uh, The earliest known actual Aryan-speaking people are thought to have originated in prehistoric Iran. And then these people migrated throughout present-day Pakistan into northern India sometime around 1500 BCE. Previous inhabitants of the Indian subcontinent, speaking Sanskrit, called these newcomers uh, newcomers, uh, Arya. Arya. There we go. Arya. Uh, And the English word Aryan comes from this Sanskrit word Arya. Interestingly, the term has a linguistically related equivalent in the Persian language, uh, Iran. Uh, this word is the source, of course, of the modern country name of Iran. Uh, and if you do a Google image search for Iranian people, they do not physically resemble Aryan Nazis, unless you're colorblind and brain damaged. So early Aryans, not white, just like Jesus and every other character in the Bible. I've always cracked up at these depictions, these notions. You know, the blue-eyed, fair-skinned Jesus, uh, or of Caucasian depictions of Mother Mary, the apostles, any of the Old Testament characters, like, like they weren't white. Like case closed 100% for sure they weren't white. But this is, you know, the, the kind of ideas that, that Hitler and his people spread around. Uh, you ever met anyone from the Middle East? Someone whose family goes back in the Middle East for multiple generations? You know, unless they have some old European crusader blood or some recent Jewish resettlement blood, you know, European Jewish resettlement blood, you know, not white. And, and neither were the Aryans. They didn't have blonde hair, didn't have blue eyes. Pushing this narrative, nothing more than propaganda. So, so where does the blonde hair, blue eyes association come from? Well, blonde hair and blue eyes currently believed to have originated in the Nordic lands around the Baltic Sea around 11,000 years ago, after the last ice age. The results of genetic mutations that began in those ancient Balts, the Balts not believed by most people uh, who study the migration patterns of pre-written language meat sacks to be the same people as the ancient Aryans. So this, this, they're, it's nonsense. It's nonsense what the, uh, the narrative they were pushing. And now let's back up even further with all this racial shit that Hitler used as basically his entire motivation to take over the world. This idea of racial purity that led to searching for nonsense like the Holy Grail. Well, the idea that there were a lot of ancient and very uh, distinct different races of early humans is horseshit. That is a belief not supported by modern uh, archaeology, by modern anthropologists. Humanity believed to have uh, evolved out of Africa, migrated, or, you know, humans, early humans, uh, believed to have evolved out of Africa migrated around the world from there. Like I've said on older sucks, at the end of the day, 
based on everything we now know, were all essentially really African, if you go back far enough. So even if the Bolts and Aryans were the same people, which, you know, some scholars do still believe, even if they did make it to the Indus Valley and, and founded the beginnings of Indian and Pakistani culture, it wouldn't matter anyway. Because if you traced it back far enough, you'd eventually make it back to ancestors common to all of us meat sacks. According to humanity's current collectively accumulated archaeological and anthropological evidence, Africa is the motherland for all of us. Cannot stress that enough. Important drum to beat a lot. This notion that there was one ancient Nordic-looking group of blue-eyed, blonde-haired Aryan motherfuckers who were superior to all these other distinct groups is just a bunch of misinformed racial superiority justification nonsense, uh, you know, built on the back of nothing, on, on lies. It, it's a racist wish, not anything backed by current scientific evidence. Also, to further debunk the Aryan migration models that Hitler and his goons believed in, archaeology has shown that the Indus Valley civilization was highly developed before any Aryan-speaking people arrived. Aryans did not provide them with this big cultural leap forward like Hitler believed. Some evidence suggests that the Indus Valley civilization had social conditions comparable to Samaria, even superior to the contemporary Babylonians and Egyptians. Uh, religions uh, arose in the Indus Valley around 5,500 BCE, farming communities around 4,000 BCE, urban living around 2,500 BCE. The area reached its cultural peak in 2000 BC, and the Aryans didn't, uh, you know, heavily influence any of that, didn't conquer any of that. Nevertheless, early German propagandists, both surrounding Hitler and influencing him as he rose to power, took their Aryan superiority myths even further beyond the scope of credibility, like way further. Uh, the grandfather of all Aryan theorists was a French aristocrat known as Arthur de Gabineau, or Gabineau. Arthur came from an old, well-established aristocratic family, and he was an elitist, pompous, super classist, racist fuckface. Uh, following the revolutions of 1848, this series of uprisings across Europe where the common peasants of Europe rose up against a variety of monarchies and the aristocracy, Gabineau was consumed by fear that the revolutions were the beginning of the end of aristocratic Europe, with common folk descended from lesser breeds taking over. In 1853, he published a 1,400-page tomb, an essay on the uh, inequality of the human races, promising to diagnose the mortal disease of civilizations and explain how societies collapsed. His hypothesis was that every major civilization had been created by white Aryans, like, like all of them, even in the New World. He wrote that the once, once the pure Aryan stock of a particular civilization became diluted, by fucking and being fucked by members of other inferior racial groups, then that civilization would go into decline and inevitably collapse. So, you know, uh, his writings were just, just a wee bit horrifically insulting to most people on earth. I mean, I mean, I get the Polish being inferior. That's, that's why their country has been sacked so many times, Avi. But everyone else, heck, come on. And uh, an old joke, by the way, S save your email, new listener. Uh, JK, I JK sometimes. Gosh, dang. Uh, Gavigno wrote that ancient Egypt was an Aryan colony from India. China was too before it became, quote, absorbed in Malay and yellow races. <laughs> His words, not mine. Okay. Also, originally white, according to Count Gavigno, were the Assyrians, with whom may be classed the Jews. Uh, Middle Eastern people being given a ca Caucasian revisionist makeover here. A bunch of white European looking people doing shit in the Holy Land. Uh huh. Sure. Uh, other civilizations that obviously started off with fake white people uh, were, quote, the three civilizations of America, the Alleghenian, the Mexican, the Peruvian. Uh, pretty sure those aren't the names of American civilizations, but okay. Right? Take, take that American Indian tribes. You know, Europeans didn't take anything from you because you were already European. <laughs> Bam! Nazi mic drop. Nobody's, you know, he's saying that, the, what the fuck? Like the people in the Americas were started by Aryans. Uh, Gabignon concluded his sweet, super factual book by stating that non-Aryans were incapable of forming advanced societies. <laughs> yep, Teensy bit super duper racist. Faced with any evidence of non-white civilizations, Gabino would claim that white people had created them and then just mysteriously vanished. So, you know, if there was no archaeological evidence, he'd be like, well, okay, well, okay, disappeared, not my problem, but it was for sure white people. Uh, Gabino wrote, uh, wrote his book before Charles Darwin published his theory of evolution. And he wrote it, you know, with uh, zero understanding of fucking anything about science, no knowledge of linguistic, you know, trees, nothing. He just is what he believed. He, he claimed that Germanic people were of purer Aryan stock than other Europeans, not because of any German nationalist leadings. He wasn't German, 
Uh, he did that because he believed that France's nobility was descended from Germanic Franks. And well, I guess he was just really, really insecure and he really wanted to feel important. And Gabinio's racial theories would obviously appeal to Hitler and his goon weirdos greatly. I guess and Hitler jerked off so, so many times to Gabinio's teachings. We are the whitest of the whites. Yeah, yeah, we're so white. And we're the most powerful. Uh, also, Germans, I should add, uh, not descended from one ancient group. So there's so many problems with what he wrote. Uh, modern Germans descended from five different tribes. The Saxons, the Franks, the uh, Thuringiae, the Alamanniae, the Bavariae. Uh, these five tribes, sometimes with the inclusion of the Frisians, are considered the main groups that, uh, you know, sexed it up to form modern Germans. That's another problem with this whole Aryan myth is that now there's, there's a variety of Germanic tribes that were, that were different. Uh, different linguistically, culturally. Uh, and again, go back far enough, you know, Africa. You get it. Uh, other even crazier teachers, uh, crazier teachings, excuse me, also appealed to Hitler and the fake Aryan echo chamber of hate and stupid he surrounded himself with. A Nazi theorist named Alfred Rosenberg believed that the Nordic race was descended from proto-Aryans who he believed had prehistorically dwelt on the North German plain but, and ultimately originated on the lost continent of, wait for it, Atlantis. Yay! Now we've brought the lost island of Atlantis into this mix. Fuck yeah, bro. Sweet. Cool story. Uh, and we haven't even come close to maxing out on this week's crazy. It's soon going to get even crazier. This Rosenberg motherfucker would be hanged for war crimes after the war, and it's too bad he couldn't have been brought back to life and then hanged again by his dick. Uh, he would be one of the main authors of the Holocaust, pushing and crafting that pro-Aryan, fuck everyone else ideology that cost millions of people their lives. As a Nazi party's chief racial theorist, Rosenberg oversaw the construction of a human racial ladder that justified Hitler's racial and ethnic policies. Heinrich Himmler, uh, the later architect of the Holocaust, boy, did Himmler love Rosenberg's theories. A big fan, big fan. Pretty sure Himmler used to beat off in his Nazi office to Rosenberg's theories even more than Hitler did. This, uh, oh, yeah, Rosenberg, the Germans are descended from Atlantis, uh, and the Jews, they're diluting our heroic Atlantean blood. Uh, nine, nine, not yet, little Himmler. Not yet, I want to read so much more. Uh, Rosenberg built on the works of Gabinio and others, took it further. He was a big believer of the Judeo-Mason conspiracy. It centers around notions of a secret coalition of Jewish leaders and Freemasons pulling economic strings for the whole world. Uh, he was basically who I imagine David Icke or Alex Jones, like who, who, might, who they might be if they were put in a position of actual extreme political power. Right? Just Alex Jones with Nazi power. The, the frogs are gay. We know that. We know that for a fact. We know that the Jewish Freemasons made the frogs gay to make homosexuality more appealing to strong frog-like Aryan boys and girls to try and get them to keep them from breeding later, thus allowing the Jewish Masons and their freedom, Aryan-hating gay frogs, to destroy us. Can you smell the sulfur? Can you smell the Jewish Freemason demon sulfur? Uh, and Alex Jones really did think nefarious forces were making frogs gay, by the way. I didn't just pull that out of thin air. Uh, Rosenberg believed that Germans' racially pure, supposedly Aryan ancestors lived at one time on the lost island of Atlantis. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and, and I should note here that a lot of people at the time did actually believe in the Atlantis myth. Not the Aryan roots part necessarily, but the lost island part. People from archaeologists, explorers to politicians, people that included a former U.S. congressman we talked about way back in Suck 43, the lost city of Atlantis episode. It was Ignatius Donnelly of Minnesota, who was an influential Atlantis believer. In 1882, Donnelly posited that Atlantis was not merely a lost island, but the very cradle of humanity itself. The earthquake that destroyed it, he maintained, was the Big Bang of civilization, which hurled Atlantis's population and its culture across the world, from which emerged the Greek gods, the forebears of the Aztecs, the founders of the cities of Mesopotamia, etc., etc. Donnelly's book, Atlantis, the Andalusian World, heralded a new Atlantis renaissance, which Helena, Bla Helena Blavatsky, Ukrainian co-founder of the Theosophical Society at the end of the 19th century also played a part. We talked about old Madame Blavat Slappy, uh, a bunch in that Atlanta suck. Antediluvian, by the way, means of or belonging to the time before the biblical flood. And Helena was quite the storyteller. Oh boy. Uh, we have her to blame for oh so much insanity that exists on the internet today. This Looney Tune said she did shit like travel along the astral plane, uh, she was visited on a regular basis by the spirit of a mysterious Indian who told her powerful secrets about the world's origins. She was super mentally unstable. Uh, you know, really, really glad her rock solid mind was around to influence people who influenced Himmler. Uh, and then, you know, Hitler. 
Uh, Blavatsky would claim or others would claim on her behalf that she was uh, when she was young, she left an unhappy marriage to a vice governor, traveled around the world where she smoked hashish with the Universal Mystic Brotherhood in Cairo, studied voodoo in New Orleans, found a lost Incan treasure in South America, uh huh, performed as a concert pianist in England, uh, visited the Mormons in Salt Lake City, got their secrets, wounded and left for dead fighting alongside a famous Italian general survived not one but two sea disasters, had an affair with an Italian opera singer, discovered an ancient language called Senzar, studied in Tibet with a group of ancient, secretive, quasi-immortal masters who told her about Atlantis and whose overall teachings would later become central to her theosis, uh, theosophical teachings. Helena's mother was a fiction author, and it seems that Helena learned a thing or two about making up stories from mom. Holy shit, was Helena so full of so much shit. Uh, Blavatsky claimed to have learned about the existence of mankind's seven root races, the fourth of which originated in Atlantis, the fifth of which was the Aryans, who descended from the Atlanteans. Like Donnelly, she believed that the wisdom of Atlantis was spread across the globe when the island was destroyed. She thought the descendants of the Atlanteans still carried in their blood the qualities of their forebears, and she believed that the descendants of Atlantis, again, were the Aryans. And of course, archaeology supports fucking none of this. Neither does any field of academic study. I mean, we all know that, right? None of it. None of this shit is true. Uh, and I say this because people still put on theosophical workshops today, right? They're pushing this shit today, right? Books, right? Asking people to subscribe to their fucking crazy ass websites. Gosh dang. Uh, the 1901 German translation of Blavatsky's book, The Secret Doctrine, exerted considerable influence on early 20th century Germanic thinkers who were obsessed with proving their theories about the primal source of their Aryan race. We'll talk more about Blavatsky in a bit. The myth of Aryan supremacy continued to be built by future Nazis or future Nazi influencers in the decades leading up to World War II. The Austrian Guido von List founded a neo-pagan movement in the early 20th century that sought to restore worship of the Nordic god Wotan, the Teutonic counterpart of Odin among the Aryans. He espoused the existence of Ariosophy, referring to the wisdom of the Aryans. There was a push to dethrone the Christian God and replace it with, uh, you know, replace the Christian God with Germanic gods of pre-Christian times. If it ain't Aryan, it ain't shit. You know, Von Liszt promoted this belief that Aryans were the sons and daughters of old pagan gods who were once very real and they produced Aryans who were capable of a number of magical things that no one else on earth could do, like fly around, speak via telepathy. If only other inferior races hadn't diluted their powers, the German people would still be gods. This is seriously the kind of shit being promoted by people like Von List. Gosh dang, Asians and Africans and non-Aryan Europeans. Why, why, why'd you take my sweet powers? You took my sweet white power powers away from me. Gosh dang. According to 23andMe, I'm down to 18% German. And even that is mixed with French. Son of a bitch, I'm probably like 10% Aryan tops. No fucking way I'm gonna be able to speak with my mind. You know, fly around with such a shitty amount of Aryan master race, root race blood in my veins. I'm so deluded. Why did my ancestors have to sleep with a bunch of fucking dirtbags? God dang. Uh, there were other uh, equally crazy ideas floating around uh, concerning the origins of the Aryan race. Some of the followers of the German occultist Rudolf von Sepent, uh, Sebottendorf, founder of the Thule Society, an important uh, Nazi ideo uh, I bleh, ideology influencer, <laughs> believed that the Aryans were the remnants of the race of, uh, or of a race of white giants who inhabited the mythical land of Hy uh, Hyperborea, or Hyperborea, there we go. A land made up in Greek mythology. All those pauses, by the way, are me looking at my many phonetic <laughs> translations that I fucking MacGyver together myself that would not make it in a uh, phonetic kind of uh, pronunciation book, but they work for me. But anyway, this Hyperborea, this land made up in Greek mythology where the god of the north wind lives. Perfect land where the sun never sets, land totally made up by ancient Greek people. Back when they were making up stories about all those crazy rapey gods we talked about back in Suck 162. The Greek gods suck. Uh, and who believed in all this weird Thule society nonsense? Who believed in old white power giants roaming the earth like monsters in some kind of racist Dungeons and Dragons campaign? Well, according to Hitler biographer Ian Kershaw, the Thule Society's membership list reads like a who's who of early Nazi sympathizers and leading figures in Munich. Man, this crazy Thule giant talk feels like it could make for the beginnings of a, of a new routine for resident suck comedian Steph Coxcurvy. 
if you believe that the white man is superior because he descended from flying Aryan ice giants that speak with their minds, you might be Nazi. Amongst the Thule tools was Alfred Rosenberg, that pro-Atlantis, pro-Aryan, super anti-Semitic icon, Alex Jones-like conspiracy nut we talked about earlier. Uh, Rosenberg became the Nazi movement's main ideologue, and he wrote in his book, The Myth of the 20th Century, that the old legends about Atlantis may appear in a new light. It seems far from impossible that a flourishing continent once rose above the waters, and upon it a creative race produced a far-reaching culture and sent its children out into the world of seafarers and warriors. Far from impossible, huh? Sure. Uh, I bet this guy thought that pixies and unicorns were also far from impossible. Probably loved unicorns, right? Loved how white they were. Another prominent member of the Thule Society was Heinrich Himmler, uh, the dude who would lead the Nazi hunt for the Holy Grail. Himmler was the guy who would become the head of the SS and be the chief of the German police, as well as the Reich's interior minister, one of the chief architects of the final solution. There was no vice Führer position, but essentially Himmler uh, was second command. And Himmler fucking loved this shit. This nonsense influenced him greatly in his youth, which shows how dangerous wackadoodle ideas can be. Hitler and his goons did not come up with anti-Semitism. They were born into a world where it already existed. They were born into a world where nuts were handing out pamphlets and giving speeches about ideas like Aryans being descended from gods or giants or Atlantis. They'd be also powerful as their magical bloodline was pure again. And ideas can be powerful, powerful things, even the crazy ideas, which is why we must continue to openly shit on the really bad ones. Uh, Himmler and a few other ding-dongs established the Ancestral Heritage Research and Teaching Society called uh, Anunnabi, which stood for Ancestral Heritage. Himmler, as Heather Pringle wrote in her book, The Master Plan, Himmler, Scholars, and the Holocaust, conceived of this research organization as an elite think tank, a place brimming with brilliant young mavericks and brainy upstarts, up-and-comers who would give traditional science a thorough cleansing. And by cleansing, uh, I think like whitewashing. Nazi think tank. Can anything good come from a Nazi think tank? No, of course not. The Anunnabi sought to transform race theory into an official German science that would supplant the so-called Jewish sciences, a.k.a. actual science, and provide academic validation for the ancient origins of the Aryans and their supremacy. Great. They made groups that ac academically, even scientifically, sought to legitimize all this Atlantis ice giant god talk. Towards this end, the Institute organized expeditions of archaeologists, musicologists, philologists, anthropologists to the four corners of the world, from Iran to Tibet to Finland, in a search for evidence of Aryan supremacy. Uh-huh. Now wackadoodles are trying to prove this shit with evidence. These expeditions would lead to the Nazi search for the Holy Grail. So did Hitler himself believe in all this crazy shit? No, probably not. Uh, most historians don't think he did, at least not all of it. But he was more than happy to promote all of this since it helped motivate his followers to take over the world as the rightful supreme master race. It was great propaganda fodder. Hitler's right-hand lunatic, Himmler, he did seem to be a true believer. Hitler, uh, of course, did believe in Aryan supremacy, and he was in favor of ideas that promoted uh, Aryan supremacy, no matter how crazy they might be. He knew, again, that his propaganda department spread message such as the German people were descended from gods, or that a big part of the reason that post-World War I economy in Germany had collapsed, the reason a lot of Germans in the 1920s and 30s were suffering, was because inferior races were watering down their superpowers. He knew that all that was good for the cause. The search for a strongly nationalistic, Aryan-centric national prehistory had begun after Germany's loss in World War II in 1918, or World War I, excuse me, 1918. The terms of the Treaty of Versailles had crippled the German economy, demoralized the German people. Psychologically, they felt desperate. Their collective self-esteem was at an all-time low. They were desperate to find something to feel good about again, to feel proud of. They'd just gotten their ass kicked. They were poor and suffering. And Hitler and his occult-loving Aryan goons fed that desperation with preposterous lies that many of them happily gobbled up. I mean, historically, people seem to always have loved a scapegoat. And they love to think that they're the best people in the world, right? They're on the winning team. Who doesn't want to be in the winning team, right? We're number one. We're number one. We used to be giants. We used to be gods. We come from Atlantis. Our problems are because of the Jews and the other inferior races. That's why we can't fly. That's why we lost the war. <laughs> Gotta hope my neighbors can't hear what I'm saying. I hope the building manager, Doug, doesn't hear what I'm saying because his office directly <laughs> is behind the wall I'm talking towards where he has a financial planning office. Oh, my God. I, I doubt he would love to be talking to a client about their financial future. While through the wall, they hear what sounds like a fucking white power maniac ranting, especially since we're living in Northern Idaho. Or, I don't know, 
Maybe they fucking love it because we're living in North Idaho. I don't know. Maybe there's a couple of those people still around. I like what you're doing here, Doug. Good for you. We got to keep the bloodlines pure. How Hitler. Uh, no. Anyways, uh, the Nazis uh, funded organizations like the Anunnaki, where archaeologists, academics were expected, were pressured to find archaeological results that fed these pro-Aryan, you know, beliefs that they want to present as facts. Nazi archaeology rarely conducted with an eye towards accuracy. It was a propaganda tool designed to both generate nationalistic pride in Germany, you know, in Germans that I just talked about. Arguably, uh, even more important, provide scientific excuses for conquest. Right, we have to win this war and become gods again. It's our destiny. It's the only way we can communicate telepathically and fly and shit is if we rid the world of inferior races. And, you know, all this land used to be the Aryans anyway, so we're just really taking it back. And how fucking crazy is it that all this is real? Like, all this happened. Like, these clowns were really in charge of a mini empire for a while. They ended up teaching this shit to people for, for years. They taught this stuff in school. Imagine if they had won the war. If the Nazis had won and won big, if they'd actually taken over the world, imagine what you would have been taught in school if they actually let you live. Right? Would you be taught science? Oh, no. You would be eating a steady diet of wackadoodle propaganda. You'd be taught some Atlantis god people, weird Greek mythology, fucking Aryan ice giant shit. You'd be taught Aryans were behind the pyramids and Machu Picchu and that white people used to be superheroes. <laughs> I mean, that reality wouldn't be terrible for me since I at least look Germanish. Not German, but you know, I, I can pretend. Terrible for most people. Uh, Reverend Dr. Joe P., he'd do great with his blonde hair and his blue eyes. He looks like an Aryan youth summer camp counselor. The script keeper, huh, not so much. You know, he's Jewish, so not a great reality for him. Uh, not religiously Jewish, but, you know, he wasn't even really raised Jewish, but his, his mom is Jewish, so. Oh, his 23andMe results would not be pleasing to the Nazis. It's fucking crazy, all this stuff. History lessons like this remind me of how important it is to forever keep church and state separate, for one thing. Right, you want to believe in your religion? Fine, but keep it out of the government. And that goes for all religions. New Age, Western, Eastern, all of it. Keep it out of school. Only teach what we know scientifically. Right? It can get so crazy if we deviate from that. It has gotten so crazy in the past. Once you start to deviate from real history, from real science, it gets real easy to start basing decisions on belief instead of proof. And then to have belief become the proof. And this suck illustrates exactly how dangerous that shit is. Because right? people can have some real, real crazy beliefs. So how was all this you know, crazy pro-Aryan info talked to the German people? Well, for one, there was a series of films made by a German pseudo-historian named Lothar Zotz with titles like Threatened by the Steam Plow, Germany's Bronze Age, The Flames of Prehistory, On the Trail of the Eastern Germans. These films use the appeal of myths, olden times, German triumph over change to reinforce the idea that German history was something to be proud of, be proud of your white heritage. And being proud of one's heritage, you know, white or otherwise, it's fine. Okay, fine. But obviously they took it too far. Lothar's films were edited by Nazi propagandists to fuel their pro-Aryan fuck everyone else agenda. Additionally, pamphlets were distributed, magazines were printed that put out the message that Aryans, the German people, were the best people to ever live. These publications did stuff like twist actual archaeological information into more pro-German propaganda, reporting nonsense as fact, fake news. The Nazis pushed Germans to think that the history they'd been taught prior to the rise of the Nazi party was lies, lies spread by the inferior races to keep the Aryans down. They've been fed lies because the rest of the world feared them discovering their truth and chasing their destiny fully empowered. A membership flyer for another new historical organization called Amt Rosenberg was passed around as the Third Reich grew powerful and it stated, Responsibility with respect to our indigenous prehistory must again fill every German with pride. The goal of this organization was also stated as the interpretation and dissemination of unclassified knowledge regarding the history and cultural achievements of our northern Germanic ancestors on German and foreign soil. Right? The truth has been hidden from you. We're going to share it with you now. So now you know the origins of Hitler's Aryan supremacy ideology. It was based in fake archaeology, revisionist history, also just outright wackadoodle myth and lies. All of this fueled Germanic pride, and that was used to reinforce the nationalistic fascist message Adolf Hitler was crafting with his speeches, open-air meetings, his public image. There's so much more to it, but basically the Nazis were happy to exploit the idea that Germans, at least the pure Aryan ones, were descendants of the people who conquered and built the cities of the world, the great empires, were themselves the descendants of the men and women of Atlantis, were themselves, you know, the descendants of, of, of giants, of actual gods. And all of this opened mental doors to push further and do shit like, you know, look for the Holy Grail because, you know, you think that gaining possession of a mythical relic will allow you to rule the world with supernatural powers. 
Now let's look at the Nazis' many fields of what was called border science, beliefs that pushed further and further into the occult and the supernatural. Students of Nazi history will note that when the Fuhrer and his boys got into power, they immediately attacked and shut down what could be considered occult groups, including pagans, witches, Freemasons. Why do this, right, if they're believing in the same stuff? Well, it it wasn't because of a sudden surge of skepticism. No, various occult-related activities and organizations were shut down in Nazi Germany at the urging of Heinrich Himmler's Rasputin-like personal occultist, Karl Maria Willigert. Why? To eliminate wackadoodle competition, right? To ensure that Willigert's own specific pro-Aryan brand of occultism, that his pro-Aryan pagan beliefs were the only belief system left, right? Got to get that pro-Aryan hive mind going. You can't have different ideas floating around. This crazy Villigate motherfucker was so into secret Aryan knowledge that he'd come to possess thanks to years of occult study that his wife actually left him specifically, according to what I read, because he wouldn't shut the fuck up about his weird beliefs. I love that detail. Malvin, why did you leave Carl? He wouldn't stop with the secret knowledge, Emma. The crazy asshole talks about how he has the blood of the god kings in his veins. He can read my mind whenever he wishes. Which is not true. If he would have read my mind, he would have known I thought he was a lazy fuck. And it grossed me out how he rarely clipped his fingernails and he often smelled of the cabbage. Villigate had developed a religion centered on worshipping the Germanic god Ermin. According to Villigate, German culture dated way back, like, like way back to uh, uh, 228,000 BCE, a period of time when the earth, as you'll no doubt remember being taught in school, had three suns, according to what he came up with, uh, back back when it was populated by giants and dwarfs and other mythical creatures. I'm going to repeat that. The dude who Himmler looked to for occult advice, Himmler's spiritual advisor, this guy, the second in command to Hitler's Nazi party, this dude believed that German culture dated back over 200,000 years, which is over 200,000 years further back than what is actually true. And this dude thought that when German culture started, the earth had three suns, was full of giants, dwarfs, and other mythical creatures. If you believe that ancient Germans lived on an earth circled by three suns, and that the earth was once full of giants, dwarfs, and other mystical creatures, and you think this somehow all supports a notion of white power, you might be a Nazi. I mean, think about how fucking insane this is. In the States, this is the equivalent of Vice President Mike Pence having lizard Illuminati believer, David Icke, for his, you know, personal advisor. Himmler was a fucking lunatic. Carl, I know that you have answered this question before, but how many sons did the Germans of old have? Three sons. That is right. That is right. Uh, so what happened to the other two sons? Did the Jews take them from the German forefathers? Of course, yes, of course they did. Thanks, Carl. The Jews attacked so much. Even the extra sons, uh, you know, which I've certain made the winters much more bearable. What about the giants and the dwarfs? Did, did the Jews somehow ruin that for the Germans as well? Yes, of course they did. Thank you, Carl, for your wisdom. Uh, Villigate also claimed to be descended from a line of kings going all the way back to this ancient period of time, like a couple hundred thousand years. So, you know, that would be a wee bit hard to know or prove. Uh, did I mention that Villigate was a diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic? <laughs> yeah, buddy. You knew the Nazis were crazy, but did you know that they were this fucking crazy? Himmler consulted a diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic Villigate on a wide variety of issues. My God. And look, I don't want to bash people with mental health issues, right? I'm not setting out to do that. But if you're a paranoid schizophrenic, you know better than anyone that if you go off your meds, probably shouldn't be advising anyone on anything. What should we do to gain the upper hand in our battle against the Jews and the allies with the blacks and the other inferior races, Carl? You, 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 um, you gotta, 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 gotta get the spirit destiny. Got to more people, more people. They're the hollow earth. Deep, 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 deep in the tunnels. Uh, Atlantis. Gotta find the giants. Holy grail. Holy grail. Holy grail. One grail to rule them all. I, I can read it in the mashed potatoes. I can read it in the mashed potatoes, 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 potatoes. The Jews had the potatoes. They pick them in the two suns they stole. Uh, ice giant king will have all the answers. That is exactly what we would do, Carl. 
We'll find the hollow tunnels to get the potatoes from the two sons, and that'll help us win the war. I'm sure of it. Yes, you will get your mashed potatoes, dear Carl. I I could not do any of this without your wonderful mind. Using Billigut's insane prophecies, like quite literally insane prophecies, Himmler chose a castle in Wolfsburg uh, to serve as a base of operations for his SS troops. He established a room in his castle with a crystal representing the Holy Grail. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, they got got a crystal Holy Grail room now. These guys are in charge of an empire, and, and they're buying a fucking castle based on the advice of a mentally ill prophet. A lot of really good sound decisions being made right now. Uh, Villigat also uh, helped in the design of the rune-covered death's head rings that the SS troops wore, personal awards that Himmler issued himself. There have also been rumors of a Nazi occult society based on Vril, a magical substance described in the book The Coming Race that was published anonymously in 1871, later determined to be the work of English author Edward buller Lighton. Excuse me, Lord Lighton. Lord Lighton was a big fan of Madame Blavatsky. Sweet. One wackadoodle giving birth to the next. Uh, Lord Lytton's 19th century work of fiction. Fiction. Describes a traveler exploring a cave who becomes lost, discovers a subterranean civilization peopled by supernatural beings called the Vrilya. In the novel, these beings made use of a fluid called Vril, which they could telepathically manipulate to heal, destroy, or change their surroundings. Uh Uh-huh. And the Nazis may have looked for this cave. They may have believed that Lord Lytton was onto some shit. And based on what you'll learn later in this suck, I'm going to say this probably happened. The existence of a Nazi occult society focused on a supposedly real version of Viril is unverified, but not difficult to imagine that such a society could have found a purchase with some occult-obsessed Nazis. Okay, now let's talk about border science. The Nazis called their various work in the occult border science to legitimize it. Still has the word science in it, so it must be fact, right? No, they said that there are many diverging fields of, you know, studies crossed borders between what was known and what was unknown. And, and this is why I get mad when flat earthers want to be taken seriously by academics and scientists. No, your belief is fucking asinine. It's fantasy. And if you want to believe it, okay, fine. I think you're being super ignorant, but fine. But if you want that belief to be placed alongside the science-based belief, and around Earth, as if the two belief systems are equal, as if flat Earth belief is some kind of border science, well, then get the fuck out of here. Doing that opens the door to any other stupid idea based in nothing to be taken seriously, like the idea that, it, that Aryans are descended from Atlantis. Border science was a term adopted by 1930s occultists to cover fields like parapsychology, astrology, clairvoyance, that, that suddenly found favor with Hitler's fact-averse government. Let's take a little more uh, closer, closer, let's look look a little more closely, excuse me, into the organizations that did most of the Nazi pseudoscientific research. Then we'll take a closer look at Hitler, uh, Himmler and a few other people like Madame Blavatsky, and then we will look at the search for mythological relics like the Holy Grail. Uh, the Nazis had two major groups dedicated to looking into all this super weird shit and legitimizing it. The Anunnabi, we talked, to them, uh, talked about them a bit, and the Amtha Rosenberg, who we barely mentioned. Uh, Let's start with the Anunnabi, which means, again, ancestral heritage, translates as inheritance of the forefathers. Uh, The Anunnabi was a secret society created by Heinrich Himmler, uh, Hermann Wirth, Richard Walter Dahr. Uh, Hermann Wirth was a Dutch historian obsessed with Atlantis. Sweet. Dahr was the creator of the Nazi blood and soil ideology, a push to, uh, you know, get Germans to move away from urban living, live more simply on farms. Okay. I mean, so I guess all of their ideas weren't evil. The last one wasn't evil. Uh, Dar was also the head of the Race and Settlement Office in 1940. He had the following published in Life magazine by Blitzkrieg, before autumn. Uh, We shall be the absolute masters of two continents. A new aristocracy of German masters will be created with slaves assigned to it. These slaves to be their property and to consist of landless, non-German nationals. We actually have in mind a modern form of medieval slavery which we must and will introduce because we urgently need it in order to fulfill our great tasks. These slaves will by no means be denied the blessings of illiteracy. Higher education will in the future be reserved only for the German population of Europe. Okay, okay, so I guess it was a pretty evil idea. Uh, I didn't, uh, when I said it wasn't evil before, I I didn't have all the full details. So pretty evil. Officially, Enernabi was registered as a study society for primordial intellectual history 
and German ancestral heritage. But as I stated earlier, the organization's real goal was to research the cultural history and characteristics of the Aryan race only in an effort to prove that Aryans were a godlike advanced race from which Germans were descended. The ultimate goal of Himmler was, uh, with a lot of this was to create a new Aryan-centric religion that would replace Christianity as the only religion in Germany, right? This is the only religion is the religion that says that Aryans are the fucking best and no one else is close. The Anunnabi officially integrated into the SS around 1940, set about on numerous missions all over the world to search for rare relics, mythical places, ancient secret texts, the organization had many, up to 50 different branches dealing with more than 100 research products in total, all of which I'm sure were fucking crazy. Uh, and sorry, some of the numbers here are vague. Many of the records of this group were destroyed by the time the Allies won World War II. Uh, some of the branches were responsible for research in Tibet. We know some stuff about them. Others based in India. Archaeological excavations were conducted in Germany, Greece, Poland, Iceland, Romania, Croatia, many other countries including several on the continent of Africa, South America, occupied Russia. And what a fucking weird job these poor archaeologists had, right? To, to have to go try and find magical relics for Himmler and the Fuhrer that you know most of them knew did not exist. Like, like how terrible if you're actually good at archaeology and you knew this shit wasn't true. And then you get sent to like Tibet to find a tunnel that was supposed to lead to the hollow earth where Aryan giants were supposed to live. And then you have to answer to Himmler every once in a while, right? Because he's giving you a budget for this. Where, where's the entrance, Alfred? You've been in Tibet for how long now? For six months, yeah? How many magic giants has you found? Nine? And what about the magical dwarfs? Nine? What about in the signs of Atlantis? Nine? Does he hate the Deutschland, Alfred? Nine? Then I recommend strongly that they work a little harder to find what they know is real. Carl, tell them what we know is real. You, 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 gotta, you, gotta, find the, you gotta find the dwarfs, magic dwarfs, magic, 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 magic dwarfs. They will take you to the giants. They have the schnitzel. They're the only ones who can make it. <laughs> the Jews took the two sons. That's why it's so important, 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 important. The ice giant king will have the answers. You, you heard him. You heard him, Alfred. Listen to Carl. The ice giant king will have the answers. It's, it's so easy. And yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I wish I could just do the whole episode like that. Uh, yes, I know it doesn't make sense that Carl has an American accent, but it makes his nonsense even that much funnier to me. <laughs> Tibet was especially a priority for the research. Uh, Madame Blavatsky knew there were all kinds of secrets there, and Himmler wanted to find them. One of the main reasons the Institute uh, for Inner Asian Research was founded was because of those old Blavatsky theosophical uh, Tibetan secrets that she talked about. Another one of the research institutes of the Anunnabi dealt with the world ice theory, which suggested that there were several moons in different orbits around Earth, and the approach of those extraplanetary objects resulted in polar shifts, cataclysmic events. Scientists in this organization, and I use the term scientists very loosely, thought that Earth was created when a giant chunk of space ice collided with the sun that one time, if you forgot, do you remember that? When the space ice touched a giant flaming ball and somehow made a bunch of dirt and water? That makes sense. Good, good signs. Uh, this theory was initially proposed in the 1912 book Glacial Cosmogony, written by a really good mechanical engineer who was really bad at uh, Earth origin theories, a guy named Hans Horbiker. Uh, in this wackadoodle as fuck book, Hans says that the white Aryan man was not descended from the apes, as were other inferior races, but rather the white man came from divine sperma brought to Earth by meteors. Uh huh. And then the space sperm developed into uh, the godlike supermen of the ancient civilization of Atlantis Thule, which employed parapsychology, uh, mystical electricity, similar to like Thor's hammer. Uh-huh. If you believe that the white man is descended from superhuman space sperm and that everyone else comes from monkeys, you might be a Nazi. Hitler did believe in this theory, at least the part about the world starting off as a big chunk of space ice, at least for a while. That apparently made a lot of sense to him. Himmler loved the whole thing. Yeah, it's a space bomb. That is how, that is how the Aryans got to Earth to live amongst the monkeys and the Jews. It was a space bomb. Carl, tell them about the space bomb. Uh, space bomb, space, space bomb, space uh, Ice giants set the white power meteorite. Huh? One of the giant stone, stone balls. One of us brought the master race. Master race, master race. How's I make a bratwurst? Apart from history exploration, Anunnabi also conducted top-secret experiments, some of which are thought to have involved artifacts or ancient texts. 
that were discovered during those expeditions. A variety of horrible experiments also performed on live human beings throughout all this. The documentation for many of these uh, experiments has been destroyed, but we know that stuff like seeing how well non-Aryans dealt with ice was one of them. Naked non-Aryans put in tubs of ice to see how long it took hypothermia to kill them, you know, because they weren't, they weren't uh, descended from gods and couldn't handle the ice, you know, shit like that. Uh, the other organization that worked on this sort of stuff was Amt Rosenberg. Amt Rosenberg was an official body for cultural policy and surveillance within the Nazi party, headed by Alfred Rosenberg. Established on April 27th, 1934, under the name of the Anstel Rosenberg, with offices in Berlin, the group, like the Anunnabi, was all about the acquisition of art objects across the occupied territories of the Reich. And that Anunnabi, by the way, I may be butchering that word. I could not find a, a solid pronunciation that wasn't given by somebody only speaking fluent German, which, you know, is going to sound a little weird for me. Uh, we'll touch on the kind and, uh, and quantity of loot this group and others gathered over time later in this episode. Right now, let's dig it a bit into the guy that connected the Nazis to the Holy Grail and the occult more than any other single person, Heinrich Himmler. Going to give a, a quick little bio on this utter nutter. Might do a full suck on this fucking ding dong someday down the road. Uh, Himmler was born on October 7th, 1900 in Munich, Germany. He was a politician, police administrator, military commander who, as I said, became the second most powerful man in the Third Reich. He was the son of a Roman Catholic secondary school master, studied agriculture after World War I, was an unsuccessful chicken farmer. Like a lot of German youth after World War I, he was pissed about losing the war. He wanted someone to blame, so he blamed, like many at the time, German Jews, and then eventually all Jews, and then everyone who wasn't Aryan. In his early 20s, he joined rightist paramilitary organizations, became a, uh, you know, uh, a member of one of those, Ernest Rom's Imperial War Flag. He participated in Adolf Hitler's Beer Hall Push, in Munich, the Beer Hall Push, uh, also known as the Munich Push, uh, Push being a plotted revolt or attempt to overthrow a government, especially one that depends upon suddenness and speed, was an abortive attempt by Adolf Hitler and Eric, or Eric Ludendorff to start an insurrection in Germany against the Weimar Republic, November 8th and 9th, 1923. So Himmler went way back with Hitler, early adopter of his ideologies. Uh, Himmler uh, joined the Nazi party in 1925, rose steadily in the party's hierarchy, was elected a deputy to the Reichstag, the German parliament in 1930, when Hitler's uh, party gained over 18% of the seats, 107 in total in the German parliament. Uh, the previous election, 1928, they'd only acquired 12 seats. So 1930, you know, they're really getting going, really ascending towards their uh, eventual takeover of the German government. The year before, 1929, Himmler had been named the head of the SS, the protective echelon, Hitler's elite bodyguard. Hitler, uh, Himmler immediately began expanding the SS, reached a membership of more than 50,000 by 1933. From 1929 until the regime's collapse in 1945, the SS was the foremost agency of security, surveillance, and terror within Germany and German-occupied Europe. After Hitler gained power on January 30th, 1933, Himmler became head of the Munich police, soon afterward became commander of all German police units outside Prussia. He quickly used his power to establish the Third Reich's first concentration camp at Dachau. In uh, April of 34, Himmler was appointed assistant chief of the secret state police in Prussia. From that position, he extended his control over the police forces of the whole Reich. He masterminded the June 30th, 1934 purge in which the SS eliminated another Nazi group, the SA, the storm detachment that had protected Nazi leaders during speeches and demonstrations as they rose to power as the security and police force within the Nazi party. This purge strengthened uh, Hitler's control over both the party and the German army. After he began to view the SA's head, Ernest Röhm, as a serious rival, so he and Himmler and others made up shit about Röhm trying to overthrow Hitler and they had him killed. And Hitler was, as you'd guess, grateful to Himmler for helping him, you know, kill Rom. And he expanded Himmler's power within the Nazi party. With Hitler's blessing, Himmler began to build the SS into the most powerful armed body in Germany next to the actual armed forces. He officially assumed full command of the security police and the order police as the head of the SS and chief of the German police on June 17th, 1936. World War II brought a vast extension of Himmler's empire and the resources at his command. Uh, after Germany invaded the Soviet Union in 1920, or in, yeah, in June 1941, Himmler was entrusted with the administration of the conquered territory with the goal of eliminating any Soviet system of government. In July of 42, Hitler appointed Himmler to head a German anti-partisan campaign in the occupied areas behind the front lines, a campaign targeted at the racial and political enemies of the Third Reich, characterized by widespread acts of mass murder and atrocity. 
Himmler would oversee the deployment of the uh, Eisen, Eisengruppen and the massacre of Jews and other victims at sites such as Baba Yar and Ukraine during the early war years. Man, that was a, a crazy, terrible massacre in just two days, September 29th and 30th, 1941. Over 33,000 Jewish people were massacred in just this one place. Right, just in this Baba Yar, Ukraine, families were told they were going to be resettled. Instead, they were forced to undress. They were led to a ravine that was 150 meters long, 30 meters wide, 15 meters deep, and then mowed down with machine guns. The wounded buried alive amongst the dead. At least 29 people laid down before being shot on top of other bodies, pretended to be dead as other bodies were laid on top of them, then snuck off in the middle of the night before they were buried alive and they lived to tell their tales. Unreal, man. This is horror beyond, far beyond anything I can even imagine in any kind of real way. And Himmler, Hitler's delusional, evil, fuckface lapdog was behind this and many other atrocities. Himmler organized concentration death camps in German-occupied Poland in which millions of Jews were systematically slaughtered, camps that provided free labor for the war effort, and bodies for more horrific and involuntary medical experiments. By 1943, the now 42-year-old Himmler had become Minister of the Interior and a force of his own for Reich administration. He expanded the armed SS until with 35 divisions, it rivaled the actual Nazi army in size and strength. He gained control of the Nazi intelligence network, the Werewolf, uh, the Werwolf, a guerrilla force continue, or intended to continue the struggle after the war. Also ended up commanding two army groups. Uh, not content with military power alone, Himmler attempted to set up an uh, autonomous SS industrial empire. When that provoked resistance from Hitler's minister for armaments and war production, Albert Speer, Himmler apparently orchestrated an attempt on Speer's life in February 1944. And in the final months of the war, Himmler suffered increasingly from psychosomatic illnesses, began to lose favor with the Fuhrer. He increasingly found himself outside of Hitler's inner circle as the war wound down to a close. In April 1945, it became known that Himmler hoped to become the new Fuhrer. He negotiated with both Sweden to form an alliance with the Allies, hoping to form this uh, new alliance that would be against the Soviet Union. Hitler found out, stripped Himmler of his offices, ordered his arrest, and then disguised as a common soldier. Uh, Hitler, Himmler attempted, attempted to escape, captured by the Allies, and then he committed suicide by taking poison, dying on May 23rd, 1945, at the age of 44. And now that we know a bit more about who Himmler was, Let's learn a bit more about some of his ideological influencers. And then armed with all of this super interesting, I, I think, contextual knowledge, we'll dig into the actual quest for relics like the Holy Grail. And, and if you're wondering, why didn't we just jump into the quest right away? Well, because A, we wouldn't have learned all this cool shit. Uh, B, we wouldn't really understand who these assholes were and what these assholes' real motivations were when they decided to look for the Holy Grail and other items. C, it would have been about a 30-minute long suck. The story of the actual search for the grail, in my opinion, isn't that interesting. I mean, spoiler alert, uh, they didn't find it. Uh, on to more wackadoodles now. The ideological czar of the Nazis' supernatural Aryan ideology was Alfred Rosenberg, right? That David, I, Alec Jones type. Uh, Rosenberg was born January 12th, 1893 in Estonia. Born the son of a cobbler in what, what was at a time a part of Russia. Rosenberg studied architecture in Moscow until the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. 1919, he goes to Munich, joins Adolf Hitler, Ernest Rom, Rudolf Hess, and the newly formed Nazi Party. He liked what they were doing. He became the editor of the Nazi Party newspaper. He drew on the ideas of English racist Houston Stuart Chamberlain and on the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, a 19th century fabrication concerning a supposed Jewish plot for world domination. Ah, shit! That nonsense again. I broke down the protocols in a series of conspiracy segments in the secret suck a while back. Uh, but here's, here's a quick summary of what that uh, the uh, protocols of the learned elders of Zion is provided by the Anti-Defamation League's website. The protocols of the learned elders of Zion is a classic and paranoid racist literature taken by the gullible as the confidential minutes of a Jewish conclave convened in the last years of the 19th century it has been heralded by anti-Semites as proof that Jews are plotting to take over the world. Since its contrivance around the turn of the century by the Russian Okran uh, Okhrana, or Tsarist secret police, the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion has taken root in bigoted, frightened minds around the world. The booklet's 24 sections spell out the alleged secret plans of Jewish leaders seeking to attain world domination. They represent the most notorious political forgery of modern times. Although thoroughly discredited, the document is still being used to stir up anti-Semitic hatred. 
right? So just some nonsense propaganda, you know, written by Russians a long time ago to stir up hatred against the Jewish people. And it still continues to stir up hatred and paranoia to this day. Most conspiracy nuts who believe in diabolical secret societies, small groups of Jewish bankers controlling the world, that kind of shit. Most of that stuff can be traced back to these debunked protocols of Zion propaganda. And this illustrates the dangers of all the bullshit misinformation that gets spread around on the web. It doesn't go away, right? It doesn't go away after it's debunked. The, the lies continue to be spread as truth. So let's stomp on as many of those lies as we can. Often, 1927, Rosenberg publishes The Future Direction of German Foreign Policy, where Rosenberg urges the conquest of Poland and Russia because those lands are Aryan lands. Originally, they're not. Uh, part of the original Aryan homeland, and thus they should be restored to the proper ancient Aryan glory. Rosenberg's 1934 book, The Myth of the 20th Century, was a tedious exposition of German racial purity. It was all that Aryan shit we just learned about. Everything you knew about German history is wrong, right? Here's the real truth. It was that kind of book. Rosenberg wrote about how the Germans were entitled to dominate Europe. It was their right. Their enemies were Russian uh, Tartars and Semites. In addition to the Jews, Germany's, uh, Germany's enemies were Latin people and Christianity especially the Catholic Church. Rosenberg's anti-Semitism and advocacy of Nordic expansionism gave a certain order and direction to Hitler's violent prejudices. At the beginning of World War II, Rosenberg brought a Vidkin Quisling, the Norwegian fascist, into contact with Hitler to discuss a possible Nazi coup in Norway. And then the Germans did take Norway, taking the nation uh, in the summer of 1940, controlling it until the end of the war. After the fall of France, Rosenberg was in charge of transporting captured works of art to Germany from occupied territories. Uh, from July, July 1941 on, he was an administrator in the occupied Eastern territories. And at the Nuremberg uh, trials for war crimes after the uh, Nazis were defeated, Rosenberg was judged to be a war criminal and he was hanged and good riddance. Another player that we briefly mentioned earlier regarding border science, Gustav Kusina, his book on German prehistory laid out the archaeological justification for the Nazi annexation of Poland. Uh, Kosinia ah, was born in eight, uh, I'm gonna call him Gustav. Gustav was born in 1858, was a German archeologist and ethno-historian. And unlike a lot of archeologists and historians, he didn't seem to give too many fucks about facts. Educated as a philologist, someone who studies literary texts and written records in order to establish their authenticity, form, determination of their meaning, and educated as a linguist at the University of Berlin, Gustav was a proponent for Nordic thought. Crudely summarized as real Germans are descended from the pure original Nordic race and culture, a chosen race who must fulfill their historical destiny. No one else should be allowed in. Uh, Gustav's principal teacher was Karl Mullenhoff, professor of German philology, specializing in uh, German Germanic prehistory at the University of Berlin. 1894, at the age of 36, Gustav made the decision to switch from prehistoric archaeology, or switch over to it, introducing himself to the field by giving a lecture on the history of archaeology at a conference in Kassel in 1895. Uh, Gustav believed there were only four legitimate fields of study in archaeology, the historic study of Germanic tribes, the origin of the Germanic peoples, and the mythical Indo-Germanic homeland, archaeological verification of the philological division into East and West Germanic groups, and distinguishing between Germanic and Celtic tribes. So really, the only history that matters is German history, according to this dude. Gustav identified which geographical regions were originally Aryan, and his findings were used to justify the expansionist policies of Nazi Germany. For example, uh, Gustav asserted that face urns found in Polish sites were part of a Germanic ethnic tradition. So Poland belonged to Germany, and they should take it. And since Polish people are easily confused, they were like, fine, sound good. We, we so sorry. And they probably farted and cried and grunted and stuff. And then they were just, uh, you know, they just let the Nazis take their country. Of course, that's not true. JK, JK. Uh, Gustav had begun reading, writing, and speaking about Germanic racist nationalistic theories way back in the 1890s. He was an avid supporter of racist nationalism long before the end of World War I or even the beginning. By the late 1920s, uh, Gustav had made a connection with that dickhead we talked about, Alfred Rosenberg, the guy who had become the minister of culture in the Nazi government. And because of Gustav and many men like him, any Germ German archaeologist who did not now study the prehistory of the Germanic people, was and that alone and only, was professionally derided by the 1930s, uh, a German archaeological society devoted to Roman provincial archaeology in Germany was suddenly considered anti-German. Its members came under attack. Archaeologists who did not conform to the new Nazi idea of proper archaeology saw their careers ruined. They were ejected from the country or uh, left on their own or worse. 
little side trivia, similar shit going on at the same time in Italy. Mussolini killed hundreds of archaeologists who didn't obey his fascist dictates about what they were now supposed to study. God, I hear the word fascist. At a show in Florida a couple years ago, and I started making fun of flat earth believers. A man stood up and called me fascist, walked out of the show. Uh, no, not, not a fascist, uh, just hate fascist ideas. And one of the hallmarks of fascism is promoting lies as truth. That's why I'm fascist against, you know, stuff like, you know, the earth being flat, against arrogant and ignorant, you know, false narratives being spread. I'm against this stuff, mostly because I know historically what has happened when lies become pushed as truth and shit gets taken too far, shit like this till today. There were many other players in the propaganda war of Aryan rights to the world as the master race. Many were Hitler's officers. One was Hans Reinhardt, another German prehistory archaeologist who succeeded Gustav as the head of the University of Berlin. Even classical composer Richard Wagner has some blame in all this nonsensical ideology. One of the Nazis' biggest inspirations that stirred up the desire to find the Holy Grail was a very interesting dude we'll talk a little bit, a bit about today, Otto Rahn. Poor Rahn. His story is a sad story. He, he was a wackadoodle for sure, but he is like the least evil wackadoodle of today's tale. Weird dude who had no interest in Nazi ideology, he actually hated it, in fact, but really, really, really wanted to find the Grail and made a deal with a bunch of devils. Now let's talk about Otto Rahn. Otto Rahn was obsessed with the Holy Grail. Traveled the globe looking for it and other artifacts. Rahn was an eccentric who wore a black fedora hat, has been described by many as the Nazi Indiana Jones. Many think he was the main inspiration for that George Lucas movie character, although Lucas himself has pointed elsewhere for inspiration, which, which I get. Probably not a good business move if you were to let the public know that you based a protagonist on a Nazi. You know, if that did even happen, you know. Who'd you model uh, Indiana Jones after, George? <laughs> Glad you asked. Uh, I based him on this interesting and super cool Nazi dude, Otto Rahn. Really good Nazi, big fan. Next question. Be a little awkward. Otto Rahn was born in uh, Meiselstadt, Germany in 1904, uh, or Michelstadt. After earning his degree in philology in 1924, he traveled extensively to the caves and castles of southern France, researching his beliefs that the Cathars were the last custodians of the Holy Grail. Yeah, buddy! Now we're getting to the grail shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Cathars were a sect of Christianity headquartered in Southern France, rejected corruption and earthly indulgences, and by extension, the corruption of the Catholic Church. Uh, the sect accumulated a fair amount of power and influence until the 13th century Inquisition wiped out the heresy of the Cathars, leaving only ruins and rumors. The idea of two gods or principles, one good and the other evil, was central to Cathar beliefs. That didn't sit well with the monotheistic Catholic Church whose fundamental principle, of course, is that there's only one God. Uh, Cathars believed that there was the good God, and the good God was the God of the New Testament and the creator of the spiritual realm. And then they believed that the evil God was the God of the Old Testament, creator of the physical world, who uh, many Cathars identified as Satan. Inspired by the epic Parsifal, a medieval German poem from the same era about a dude who searches for the Holy Grail, Ron became convinced that the poem's author, a 13th century German knight, Wolfram von uh, Eschenbach, had left clues in the poem about you know, the actual Grail's actual location. And it pointed to Montsegur Castle in Languedoc, a former Cathar stronghold. Ron didn't find the Grail, but his adventures in the cathedral caves of Languedoc inspired him to write his first book, Crusade Against the Grail. And this book gave Ron a new superfan, Heinrich Himmler. Also, big fan, yeah. I like when you write about the Grail. It's totally real, right? I mean, it's, it's real. It's very real. I know, I know you want to find it. I want to find it. Carl says if she finds the grail in the Magic Giants, we can for sure get the extra sons back from the Jews. Uh, when Himmler became powerful enough, he offered Ron the full financial backing of the SS in exchange for the grail and Ron's loyalty. And Ron, conflicted as he was, accepted Himmler's offer. Nazi party, not a good fit for Ron. He was openly gay, politically liberal, not anti-Semitic or racist in any other way. Basically, his worldview directly clashed with the main thrust of Nazi ideology. But he really wanted to find the grail, and so did Himmler. And so Ron put his quest for this relic, relic ahead of his morals and joined the Nazi party and the SS. Uh, when asked how he could do this, he reportedly remarked to an incredulous friend, a man has to eat. What was I supposed to do, turn Himmler down? Ron, of course, never found the grail. Uh, but he did document his second Nazi-funded crusade to find it in a published travel journal called Lucifer's Court a heretic's journey in search of the light bringers. Himmler, despite being disappointed, he still hadn't found the grail, fucking loved the book. Ordered thousands of copies for his men. Ron resigned from the SS in 1939, or tried to, 
But like the mafia, one doesn't get to resign from the Nazis. More on Ron's uh, unfortunate end in just a few minutes. Uh, one more wackadoodle to talk about now, and then we search for the grail and explain what the fuck the grail is even supposed to be. Uh, one of the most important contributors to the occult nature of the Nazis and their quest to procure magical items is a woman who died in London two years after Hitler was born. One of the most influential wackadoodles of all time. One of the stars of our July of 2017 lost city of Atlantis suck, Madame Helena Blavatsky. Let's take a moment to revisit this nut we mentioned earlier in today's suck and better understand her influence. Helena Blavatsky, born on August 12th, 1831 in Ukraine. Uh, she died, as I said, in London, 1891, at the age of 59. Russian spiritualist who claimed to have psychic powers, highly influential author, more so in death than life. Also the co-founder of the still in existence Theosophical Society. The Theosophical Society was self-described when it formed in New York City in 1875 as an unsectarian body of seekers after truth who endeavored to promote brotherhood and strive to serve humanity. Blech. I fucking hate it how many wackadoodles consider themselves to be seekers of truth. I'm a truth seeker. You want to uh, seek truth? Promote credible ideas, you fucking maniac. Learn how to think critically. Defer to peer-reviewed experts when choosing which ideas you choose to spread. That's what I do. I don't, I don't pull all this historical data out of my ass. I find the most trusted sources I can and make sure that the script keeper, anyone else who helps research these episodes does the same. Right? You want to spread unprovable ideas like paranormal ideas? Fine. Not opposed to that with the right tone. You know, for God's sake, you know, do it with the tone of, look, I can't prove any of this. But this is what I choose to believe. Or, you know, this makes sense to me, but maybe others wouldn't agree. That's what I do in my other podcast with the Queen of the Suck, Lindsay, scared to death. I can't prove ghosts or demons exist. I don't even know if I believe they exist. My thoughts vary almost daily. All I know is that I find the supernatural world very interesting. And, you know, and I really like a good spooky sto story. Love a horror story. Love getting goosebumps and the chills. So I promote that show with the tone of, hey, not sure if this shit is real, but a lot of people swear that they've seen, you know, encountered these really scary, hard to explain things. And that terrifies me. And a lot of their stories, especially if viewed collectively, make it very hard for me to confidently dismiss the totality of dark entities others supposedly have encountered. Time suck is where I search for truth, right? I fail at various degrees in every suck because I'm fallible. Fallible meat sack with limited cognitive ability, but I do my best to find the most accurate, accredited sources of information for each and every suck. I think this suck alone pulls from over 40 sources. Telling people that you know Atlantis is real as some kind of scientific fact, that you know a lot of very specific details about the not recorded at all history of a place archaeologists do not think even fucking exist does not make you a truth seeker. Makes you a nut. Makes you at best someone who believes that they have somehow received unprovable divine knowledge that defies scientific explanation. At worst, makes you a huge liar. Okay. Give me a moment now while I step down off my soapbox that I precariously balance on the back of my high horse. <laughs> I was trying to make, God damn it. I was trying to make a horse sound. I don't know where that sound came from. What, is, what even is that? I was trying to make, <laughs> Okay, fuck it. Can't do horse sounds. Uh, to quote Family Guy's Peter Griffin, uh, you know, this stuff just, it, it grinds my gears. It, it's religious thinking taken past the point of, okay, I'm not sure I believe, you know, uh, that, I, that I can't disprove it. So fair enough if that's what, you know, you want to believe. And it's taken to this point of like, get the fuck out of here. There's no lost city of Atlantis as you describe it. We, we know that. Okay. I'll, I'll share how she describes it later. At the, at the age of 17, young Helena Hahn married... Nikifor V. Blavatsky, a Russian military officer, provincial vice governor. We touched on that earlier. They separated after a few months. And then young Helena was, uh, you know, she's already become interested in, the, in, in occultism and spiritualism. And then she said, you know, she traveled extensively for years throughout Asia, Europe, and the United States. At least that's what she and biographers claimed. As I stated earlier, most people think it's not true. Uh, 1873, she went to New York City. That does seem to be true. We do know she made it to New York because she met and influenced a lot of people there. She met and became a close companion of Henry Steele Alcott, a philosopher and author. And in 1875, they and several other prominent people founded the Theosophical Society during a time when America, especially high society America, was real into this kind of shit, as we've touched on in many sucks going back to one of my favorite tales thus far, the Harry Houdini suck. Spiritualism, right? Big deal. People looking for all these answers in a lot of interesting places. Uh, we know that Helena began to write in New York City. In 1877, her first major work, Isis Unveiled, was published. You can still buy it on Amazon. And you can read it if you have a lot of free time and you hate yourself. Uh, her teachings are painful to read after just a few minutes. Internet summaries, way better in my opinion. You get all the best details without wasting hours of your life. Uh, in this book, she criticized the science and religions of her day, asserted that mythical experience and doctrine 
were the means to attain true spiritual insight and authority. Basically, this message of ignore all of academia, all other religions, listen to me. Uh, in one seance or in one automatic writing session, I can teach you more than any professor. Right? If she would have peaked in Southern California in the 1960s and not New York City in the 1870s, I, I think she would have for sure become a cult leader. At least she would have if she was a dude. Uh, although ISIS unveiled attracted some attention, her society in New York City dwindled. I guess they weren't ready for her truths. Uh, their third eyes had some eyelashes in them or something. You know, maybe, maybe a gnat got in their third eye. Maybe a speck of dirt. I hate it. Hate it when some dirt gets in my third eye. And I, and I can't see the truth anymore. Uh, in 1879, Blavatsky and her co-lunatic Alcott go to India. Three years later, they established the Theosophical Society headquarters near the city of Chennai, began publication of the Society's Journal, The Theosophist, which Blavatsky edited from 1879 all the way to 1888. The Society soon developed a pretty strong following in India. Sweet. Asserting that she possessed extraordinary psychic powers, but never proving that. Uh, Blavatsky, during journeys to Paris and London, was accused by the Indian press late in 1884 of concocting a fictitious spiritualist phenomena. What? What? She was accused of making up a bunch of weird shit? Get out of here. Get out. What? Her? No. After protesting her innocence while on tour in Germany, she returned to India in 1884, was met with an enthusiastic reception. Bummer. They wanted her back. But then in 1885, the London Society of Psychical, uh, yeah, Psychical Research declared her a fraud. Good. Other wackadoodles think she's too crazy even for them. Uh, soon after that, she left India in failing health. She lived quietly in Germany, Belgium, finally in London, working on her small meditative classic, The Voice of Silence, 1889. Her most influential work, The Secret Doctrine, 1888. That was an overview of her theosophical teachings. It was followed uh, in 1889 by another one, uh, her key to theosophy. So, you know, three books in two years there. Her collected writings published in 15 volumes between 1950 and 1991. And then she died in 1891. At the age of 59, I should say republished, I guess, you know, they're still out there, Those, uh, the ones in the 20th century. And, and, and before we move away from her, check out what she taught people. I covered some of this in the Lost City of Atlantis. So it's definitely worth revisiting now because it's so crazy. Like, this is the kind of shit that influenced the other influencers of the Nazi party and their occult leanings. These are some of the Atlantean secrets Madam Crazy Pants shared in her book, The Secret Doctrine, that people still believe to this day. <laughs> in theosophical teaching, Atlantis was a continent and took up a significant part of what is now the Atlantic Ocean. It was massive. So, you know, kind of weird. There's no archaeological evidence. Almost like this shit was made up before people knew how to map the ocean floor, you know, before the, uh, you know, there was topographical mapping equipment available. Uh, eventually, Atlantis somehow broke off into seven peninsulas and islands. The main part of Atlantis then sunk. A lot of people left, migrated, and formed several ancient civilizations in Africa, Asia, Europe, the Americas. And how long had Atlantis been populated before it's collapsed? Oh, uh, just about four and a half million years. Four and a half million years ago, the Atlantean people migrated from a Lemurian subrace living in Africa. Uh-huh. Remember the Lemurians, the aliens, the alien type people that some people uh, to this day still think live inside of Mount Shasta, California? Well, the Atlantean people formed seven subraces. The Cro-Magnons, the Toltecs, the Mongolians, right? The, the, the Atlantean people would eventually become the Aryans. And for a long period of time, Atlantis was ruled by the Toltecs. Ancestors of the American Indians, right? Duh. From a million years ago to 900,000 years ago, the civilization of Atlantis was at its height. This was the golden age of Atlantis. Life was good in Atlantis during the golden age. So good, you guys. The Atlanteans had a variety of modern luxuries, conveniences, at least as modern as the 19th century imagination can think up. Their capital city was called the City of the Golden Gates. And at its height, it had 2 million people. They had extensive aqueducts leading uh, to the city from a pristine mountain lake. They had airships powered by the Vril, the sweet Vril. They could see two to eight people. You had to have at least two. I mean, you can't, come on. You can't have one person flying an Atlantean airship. In Atlantis a million years ago, you fuck, what, you fucking crazy? That's dumb. That's exactly how you wreck an ancient Atlantean flying car spaceship thingy that's never fully described. By drive flying it without a co-pilot. Come on, you can't do that? Gosh dang. Uh, the Atlantean economic system was socialist like that of the Incas. I, of course. Yeah, I know. I remember that. I get it. I'm in, the, I'm in the cool kids club. Sure, Blavatsky. Atlanteans were the first people on earth to develop organized warfare. Uh, their military deployed virile powered air battleships that contained 50 to 100 fighting dudes. It's very, getting very Battlestar Galactica now. Uh, these Atlantean air battleships deployed poison gas bombs. Their infantry fired fire-tipped arrows. Uh, wait, what? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Hold on. They had flying battleships and gas bombs, but fought with bow and arrows. Huh. That part doesn't seem very well thought out. 
I'm pretty sure once you advance your military technology to the point of flying battleships and poison gas bombs, maybe, I don't know, maybe you can ditch the bow and arrows. Uh, the Toltecs lived on Atlantis, worshipped the sun and temples as grand as any of those in ancient Egypt that we have no archaeological records of whatsoever. fucking ever. Uh, they were dec- decorated in bright colors, so saith our fearless seer Blavatsky. The downfall, it gets even better. The downfall of Atlantis started when some of the Toltecs began to practice black magic around 850,000 BCE. And why would they start practicing black magic? Well, they got tricked, you guys. They got tricked by a dragon, by a dragon named uh, Thivatat. Uh-huh. Actual fucking dragons. Smart, powerful dragons that could trick you into black magic. We're living on Blavatsky's Atlantis. Because of the dragon's dirty, fucking no good dragon, gosh dang tricks, the Toltec Atlanteans became selfish and materialistic. That's what happens that every fucking time when a dragon gets involved, people become selfish and materialistic. I've noticed that when I study a lot of real history. And that's how the, the, the Terranians, ancestors of the modern people, uh, or uh, ancestors of the people we now know as the Turkish people, became dominant in much of Atlantis now. The Terranians, uh, they kept practicing black magic like, like a bunch of silly assholes for a couple hundred thousand years. Uh, white magicians fought them. Uh, white magicians like the Master Moria, old Moria, a master of ancient wisdom. This kind of Jedi dude who ended up talking later to some of Madame Blavatsky's fellow theosophists from the spirit world when she was in India. And, and you know, he told them a lot of this history. Well, this, this spirit dude thing guy incarnated one time as the emperor of Atlantis in 22 or 220,000 BCE to really fight these gosh darn black magic magicians. And these black magic magicians, well, they were hard to fight because they had built an army of chimeras. Yes, chimeras are in the story now. I'm not making this shit up. This is actually what this ding dong wrote about. The black magicians used magical spells to breed human animal chimeras. They had an army of chimeras, creatures that had human bodies, but had the heads of predators like lions, tigers, and bears. And these motherfuckers would kill the white magicians and their soldiers. And then, not done, then they would eat the enemy corpses on the battlefield, which is super fucked up and not cool, you guys. And a war between the white magicians and the black magicians and the chimeras and the dragons and shit continued for like thousands and thousands and thousands of years until the end of Atlantis. The masters of the ancient wisdom telepathically warned their disciples, the white magicians, to flee Atlantis in ships while there was still time to get out before the big sinking. And then a bunch of earthquakes occurred at Atlantis not that long ago, 9,564 BCE. Recent enough for there to be a lot of evidence of this, but there isn't, but whatever. And this is the kind of shit that Madam fucking Ding Dong Cuckoo for Chimeras wrote about. And she also wrote about the origins of the supposed Aryan race. And she was crazy, <laughs> at least in the dedicated con artist type way. And the lady who wrote this shit influenced later wackadoodles. And those wackadoodles influenced the Nazi party heavily. Yeep. Now we can begin our quest for the relics. We've traced back the Aryan myth, right? We've summarized the Nazi origins that were, uh, you know, or, or I'm sorry. We've summarized the Nazi organizations that were into all this kind of in- like really out there, supernatural stuff. We've met a handful of the people who either inspired the search or were directly involved in the hunt for the mysteries of antiquity. Now let's get to the quest themselves. Yeah, yeah, fucking yeah. All right, the topic that was voted in was the Nazi search for the Holy Grail. So let's start there. Then we'll move on to the Spear of Destiny and other crazy stuff. So much more crazy to go through. I love it. Uh, First, the Holy Grail. So Himmler loved the idea of the Holy Grail. Some historians assert that in his deranged mind, it would be the greatest of all, you know, kind of occult you know, prizes to uh, religious relics to attain. He thought that if he could find it, it could grant him magic powers, including eternal life and health. Huh? I'm guessing he thought if he could get a hold of it, it could help him dethrone Hitler probably too, you know, become some kind of supernatural, immortal Nazi fucking ice giant, God King, whatever. So what the hell is the grail? Well, the Holy Grail is traditionally thought to be the cup that Jesus Christ drank from at the Last Supper and that Joseph of Era. Arimathea used to collect Jesus' blood at his crucifixion. Some think this Joseph was the uncle of Jesus' mother Mary, and Jesus' great uncle is thought to have been wealthy, possibly even a minister of mines for the Roman government. He had become a follower of Jesus' teachings. He arranged to have Jesus' body taken off the cross, placed in his own family tomb. You know, when Jesus died, the chalice or cup, which Joseph supposedly used to collect the fluid as the Holy Grail, believed by some to be the same cup used during the Last Supper. Some think that Joseph took the cup with him on his voyage to England, or on a voyage to England, is said to have hidden it in a site at Glastonbury, at the bottom of a deep well called the Chalice Well, or the Blood Well. And there's tons of other theories regarding, you know, where uh, the, the grail might have ended up. And to be clear, though, not certain that this cup exists. 
or has ever existed. Most historians think it has never existed. Uh, if it, if it, even if it did exist, not necessarily a cup. I mean, if you really want to get into it, there is, you know, no archaeological proof that Jesus existed, you know, outside of biblical sources, which doesn't mean he wasn't real. 99.99% of the rest of the world at that time made no impact on the archaeological record also. So a lot of people who were real, you know, don't show up in any records. Uh, throughout the years, the grill has been described variously as a dish, a sabarium, a chalice, a platter, a goblet, a stone, many more things, many liter uh, liter yeah, literary works have portrayed the grail as possessing miraculous healing powers. We talked about the search for the grail in the legend of the King Arthur Suck back in May, Suck 140. Uh, the origins of some sort of magical grail can actually be traced back to pre-Christian Celtic mythology in some way. As we learned in the King Arthur Suck, the quest for the Holy Grail made its way into written texts in uh, Cretan, uh, or Cretan de Troyes, old French unfinished romance, the story of the grail, or Percival, which was written about 1180 CE, as we learned uh, about, again, in the King Arthur Suck. Another French poet, Robert de Boron, further specified the Grail's Christian significance around 1200 in his poem, uh, Joseph de Aramathi, talking about Jesus' great uncle, citing the Holy Grail's origins at the Last Supper and Christ's death. So no one was even talking about this thing until the end of the 12th century. Um, you know, and, and the legends about the Grail, you know, yeah, they, they weren't written until what, over a full millennium after Jesus' death. So Vegas odds that this thing is even real, pretty low, maybe about like one in a trillion. So as I mentioned a moment, a moment ago, some Arthurian tales claim that Joseph of Arimathea brought the grail to Glastonbury in England. Others believe that the Knights Templar, a medieval order that protected pilgrims traveling to the Holy Land, seized the grail from the Temple Mount during the Crusades and secreted it away. We talked about that in Bonus Suck 23 back in June last year, how people think the Knights Templar has stashed the grail someplace, possibly Roslyn Chapel in Roslyn, Scotland. Beautiful place I'd love to visit someday, by the way. And there's a ton of other theories. A variety of artists, historians, and, well, wackadoodles have speculated on and on and on about where the grail is, what it is for centuries now. Some think the idea of the, of the grail was made popular to Hitler through the music of 19th century German composer Richard Wagner, Talk about that in a sec. Some think that Hitler had met with an occultist named Walter Johannes Stein, an Austrian philosopher, grail enthusiast, a Jewish man, actually, who was also a believer in the legend of the spirit destiny and the holy, no, a.k.a. the holy lance, believing to be the, uh, let the lance, uh, was the lance that pierced the side of Jesus as he hung on the cross. The legend of their meeting, and I say legend because not all historians uh, believe they did meet, is that Hitler had come to Stein's attention many years before World War II through an, uh, an annotated copy of Wolfram von Eichenbach's, or Eschenbach's Middle High German Arthurian Grail epic Parseval, which he stumbled across in a used bookshop and felt driven to know who this Adolf Hitler was. The two became occult fellow travelers despite one of them being Jewish, and decades later, Hitler seized the Hofburg or Hofburg Spear as soon as the Nazis rolled into Austria and stole it away to a vault in Nuremberg, where it powered, uh, some think, you know, the, the unholy forward march of the Third Reich. Okay, now to Wagner and his 1882 opera, Parseval. Wagner recast the Grail legend through a vaguely nationalist lens, or at least one through which the coming ultra-nationalists could project their own hateful visions, in which the Grail knight, Parseval, is a pure-blooded Aryan who overcomes the clearly Semitic Klingzer using the bloodied spear. Unsurprisingly, it was allegory. Most historians don't think Hitler found any literal occult truth in this Wagner story, but he may have been a big fan of this legend and then helped promote this legend as truth, or at least allow it to be promoted as truth to rally the German people towards Aryan domination uh, ambitions. Another grail tale would link the Holy Cup to Spain, and that's allegedly where Himmler looked first. Himmler, unlike Hitler, for sure believed in this shit. As bad as things were for Europe with Hitler in charge of the Nazis, man, things would have been uh, way worse, arguably, if the screwball Himmler would have been in charge. It is reported that Himmler made a wartime grail search at uh, the Mont Montserrat Abbey near Barcelona in 1940. Man, that place is gorgeous. Wasted a lot of time. Wasted a lot of research time looking at pictures of this place. Holy shit, I'd love to visit it. Looks mythical. It's like this crazy looking place set in this cliff riddled mountain, Machu Picchu kind of vibes. Uh, Montserrat is a place long shrouded in legend. Uh, Montserrat is a mountain near Barcelona. It's long been regarded as a sacred and magical place. In 880 CE, it was said that a light floated down the mountain for six Saturdays in a row. When a search party headed by a bishop went to investigate, they found that the light fell on a previously undiscovered cave. Inside the cave, completely intact, was a statue of the Virgin Mary. 
allegedly made in 50 CE. And the statue soon attracted pilgrims and monks and a monastery was eventually established in the mountain. Now, did that happen? I don't fucking, no, I don't think so. I think it's folklore. But, you know, cool story, bro. And uh, this type of place, full of these type of legends. And that, and that intrigued Himmler. Himmler enlisted Otto Rahn, right? That morally conflicted Nazi, that uh, Indiana Jones kind of prototype, grail lover we talked about earlier, the man obsessed with the legend of King Arthur. Well, Ron went and looked, but he didn't find the grail in Montserrat. Probably because it's not real. And Himmler was super bummed. He's like, dude, he's, you know, he's super bummed. Ron, those battles, pal. If I haven't you found my grail, it'll make me so happy. I just found my grail, Ron. Is, where is it? Did you look in the whole castle? Did you search the caves? What about in the, in the basement? What about in the attic? Did you did you look under the couch cushions? Did you did you dig in all the couch cushions, Ron? A lot of people think that the grail is probably in the couch cushions. I'm so sad, Ron. I hoped you would not disappoint me with the grail again. It's like you don't even listen to Carl. Don't listen to Carl out, Ron. Carl, tell him why he should listen. Yeah, mashed potatoes. Ah, special brow, sauerkraut. That's what the ice giant told me to look to get the couch cushion. <laughs> giant stone balls, the juice, hide the grill in the cushion with the gold. Now, always the gold, the gold, the gold, the gold, the gold. See, you just got to listen to Carl. He makes so much sense. He's a wonderful mind. Uh, Himmler wanted it so bad. He wanted his superhuman powers. He wanted immortality. I get it. He was so confident it would be found that he had a whole castle prepared in Fulsberg, right? For its arrival. Gosh, I got a castle, you guys. In the basement, there's a place for it. Come on, Ron. He's got his grill party all ready to go. The confetti's about to be popped. Everyone has their kazoos. The cake has been baked. The party hats have been handed out. All they need is the grail. Uh, Himmler wouldn't get his grill in Spain. He and Himmler would, uh, or I'm sorry, you know, uh, Otto Ron wouldn't find it in Spain. He, he and Himmler would continue to look elsewhere. That looking took him to a not, another Nazi grail link, a supposed map to the grail hidden in the Ghent altarpiece. Uh, the Ghent altarpiece is one of uh, the 12 oak panels that comprise 15th century Flemish artist Jean van Eyck's famous painting, Adoration of the Mystic Lamb. Often referred to as the Ghent altarpiece, this massive monumental oil painting is one of the most influential paintings ever made. Most frequently stolen as well, having been uh, taken in its entirety or parts of it taken at least six times, which is quite a feat considering that uh, altogether it's the size of a barn door. Barn door. Uh, 14 by 11 and a half feet, weighing about Two tons. Not easy to take, but it's been taken. Highly coveted by Hitler. He took it during the war. The Nazis that actually had an art theft unit, or as they sought, a cultural appropriation unit, the ERR, dedicated to taking back what they considered to be important Aryan artwork that had been held hostage by other nations who had forgotten who it belonged to. Uh, the Nazis found it in the south of France where the Belgian government had sent it for safekeeping. Hitler had it restored, then put in storage in a salt mine in the Austrian Alps where the 12,000 most famous stolen artworks from Nazi-occupied Europe were also kept in secret, destined to be featured in Hitler's planned super museum, which would be the size of a city and would display every important artwork in the entire world. Super dumb idea. Uh, sounds awesome to be able to go to one place and see all of the world's most important artwork. Uh, pretty bad place for a fire. One big fire, it all goes away. Let's never do that. Uh, the iconography of the Ghent altarpiece has long fascinated scholars. The painting quickly became the most famous piece of art in Europe when it was completed in 1432, the first large oil painting to become internationally renowned. Oil had been used, in, to, uh, used to buy in pigments in paintings since the Middle Ages, but Jean, or Jean van Eyck was the first to demonstrate the true potential of oils, which permit far greater subtlety and detail than largely opaque egg-based tempera paint, which is preferred before the Ghent altarpiece, popularized oils. Uh, the altarpiece contained over 100 figures and is an elaborate pantheon of Catholic mysticism. At its center stands a heavenly field, brimming with uniquely depicted figures around a sacrificial lamb, representative of Christ, the adoration of the mystic lamb, from which the work draws its title. The lamb stands upon an altar and bleeds into a chalice, and that chalice is the Holy Grail. Uh, and Hitler craved the Ghent altarpiece, you know, mostly because it was one of the, the most famous artworks in history. It was the product of a German artist. It was made in a realistic Northern Renaissance style that Hitler preferred, but also it had been forcibly repatriated to Belgium after World War I before which certain panel, panels of the altarpiece had been displayed in Berlin. The Treaty of Versailles mentioned only four works of cultural heritage, foremost among them the Ghent altarpiece. So it was symbolic in that way, right? Taking it back helped avenge Germany's loss in World War I. It was a nice moral victory to take it back. Hitler wanted to correct the humiliation inflicted on the German people by the Treaty of Versailles, 
recapturing the altarpiece would go, you know, quite a ways towards that goal. And also, he did think it might tell the Nazis where the grail was. Legend has it that Hitler was convinced the painting contained a coded map to lost Catholic treasures, the so-called Arma Christi, or instruments of Christ's passion, including the crown of thorns, the Holy Grail, and the Spear of Destiny. And Hitler may have believed that possession of the Arma Christi would grant the owner supernatural powers. Himmler for sure believed that. At the very least, Hitler knew it would give the German people a huge moral boost, and those items could help, you know, a, a ton, with some more we are the best, we're the chosen people type propaganda. However, the altarpiece contained, of course, no map, coded or otherwise. Hitler, Himmler, the rest of the Nazis would never find the grail. It was just a big, expensive failure to search for it. Himmler had invested heavily in Ron, and Ron had failed. Himmler took his revenge on Ron for his, for his failures by making him a guard at one of the first concentration camps. Oh, Otto, I'm so very angry with you, little Patty. I gave you so much money. I gave you so much time. I gave you all of Carl's very good knowledge. I bought you a really neat fedora hat. I got you a bull whip, so you look so cool. I bought you a leather jacket, a matching satchel. You're such a cool cat. And all I wanted in return was for you to find some magic items that would give me some supernatural powers. I got a castle for it and everything. And then you have to go poo-poo in my punch bowl. So now I have to put you in the bad boy Nazi camp. Uh, working at the concentration camp would mentally destroy Otto Rahn. He would write, I have much sorrow in my country. Impossible for a tolerant, liberal man like me to live in a nation that my native country has become. And then on March 13th, 1939, 35-year-old Ron took a handful of sleeping pills, walked out into the Alps, where he sat down and froze to death. Poor dude, hated the Nazis, just wanted to find the grail. I like to think that if he would have found it, he would have run off and given it to the Allies and not to Himmler. I mean, why, why not? Let's believe it. So that's the search for the grail, and you can see why I didn't make the search for the grail the entire focus of this suck. Would have, would have, uh, we could have followed Ron's search exclusively for it, but the travel crusade writings that he did are, are super boring. They're pretty boring. I mean, what was there for him to say, right? He didn't, he didn't find anything. Uh, from here, there's a hundred places we could go. The Nazis were all over the place, figuratively, literally. Uh, let's look at the, the search for the spear next. 1973, a British writer, Trevor Ravenscroft, wrote Spear of Destiny, the occult power behind the spear which pierced the side of Christ. And it was based on the writings of Walter Johann Stein, the Jewish-Austrian grail enthusiast who claimed to have met fellow enthusiast Adolf Hitler long before World War I. In this book, Ravenscroft revealed how as a young and struggling artist in Vienna, Adolf Hitler had been captivated by a tour guide's tale of the Holy Lance, also known as the Hofburg Spear or Spear of Destiny. And isn't that crazy, by the way, that the man who would grow to become known as one of the most evil dudes, if not the most evil dude in history, was once a struggling young artist, sensitive type, in Vienna. Right? He's fucking all emo and shit. He was 18, had a roommate, slept in, drank too much, read a bunch of weird books, worked on sketches and paintings of castles and buildings and landscapes and stuff. You know, had crushes on various girls. It's fucking weird. That guy would grow up to become the Fuhrer of the Third Reich. Uh, the Spear of Destiny, said to be one of the crown jewels of the Holy Roman Emperors, used by Roman legionary Gaius Cassius Long Longinus to pierce the side of Christ at the crucifixion. This great gilded lance, the guide told Hitler, had been carried by Roman Emperor Constantine the Great, Frankish warlord Charles Martel, and a litany of, Germany, of German conqueror kings, emboldening them with supernatural powers. It's a gloriously overworked mess of steel, iron, and brass. The Hofburg spear is embedded with what is said to be one of the nails from the cross, capped with a silver band, cloaked in gold, sometime around the 14th century. It's a real thing. You can look. It's on display in Vienna right now at the Hofburg Palace, part of the imperial treasury there. Rulers did have it in their possession. But was it used to pierce Christ's, uh, Christ's side at the crucifixion? No. No serious scholar believes that to be true. Does it have magic powers? No. No, it does not. Uh, the story of the Spear of Destiny starts around 955 CE. Vienna's Hofburg Spear supposedly aided the Holy Roman Emperor Otto I, Otto the Great, in his Slavic Wars. And then by 1098, it somehow relocated itself to Antioch in order to be discovered, discovered beneath the cathedral by the men of the First Crusade. I don't know anyone exactly knows how it got there. Uh, only this particular Spear of Destiny was just an iron lump now, not ornate like the one on display. Supposedly, all that uh, remained of the ancient artifact. Another version of this spear has lurked in an Armenian monastery since at least the 13th century. Another version of this spear lies beneath St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican, having been taken from Jerusalem to Byzantium 
around the 8th century onward to Rome in the 15th century, losing its tip that is now displayed in Paris somewhere along the way. Uh, according to the Imperial Treasury in Vienna, the Hofsberg spear dates from the 8th century, while an independent chemical test in 2003 says it originates from the 7th century. So either way, 7th or 8th, hundreds of years too old to be the spear that cut Jesus. And actually, all records of all the possible spears don't begin until hundreds of years after Christ's death. Highly unlikely that the grail or the spear or any other weird buried in Oak Island by Knights Templars type shit is real. Fuck the History Channel and the promotion of this nonsense as if it is. Fucking History Channel, right? So let's, let's soapbox about them for just a sec. History Channel pushes legends about stuff like this for, for ratings, not because it has an interest in real history, because it's not real history. The History Channel used to pump out a lot of non-sensationalized historical programming, but it didn't rate well. You know, it didn't rate as well as shows like The Curse of Oak Island, so it became a television uh, tabloid. It's a bummer. Now let's get back to the sensationalist, uh, sensationalist focus of this suck that at least I'm shitting on. Uh, Himmler's groups such as the Anunnabi sent expeditions all over the world to look for other mythical relics and information that would promote Aryan pride and legitimize their expansionist goals. Nazis traveled to Tibet uh, to search for traces of the original uncorrupted Aryan race and also to supposedly look for the Yeti, right? The abominable snowman. Uh-huh. Uh, some Nazi explorers actually brought back the remains of a Yeti. Or what they said was a Yeti. It was on display at one point, according to a few sources in an Italian museum. A genetic analysis on this thing found that some of the creature's teeth belonged to a dog. And the rest of his bones were from a bear. <laughs> uh, Himmler thought that a Yeti could be uh, proof of a link between Aryans and the race of mythical ice giants that I mentioned earlier. Are you sure it's just a bear with, with some dog teeth? Carl was so sure it's it was a white power yeti. Call, tell them about the white power yetis. Uh, space sperm. Uh, space sperm makes uh, the white power yeti go vroom vroom on a vril. Vroom vroom on a vril from Atlantis. White power yeti. See, Carl knows what is up with the yeti. He's a genius, you know. I've, I trust him implicitly with all everything. Uh, Nazis traveled to Ethiopia in search of the Ark of the Covenant, gold-covered wooden chest with a lid, uh, described in the book of Exodus as containing the two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. Outside of biblical references, no evidence this thing has ever, ever uh, existed. There's never been any other evidence found. Uh, this next expedition might be my favorite. Oh, boy. Nazis traveled to Iceland to find an entrance to a magical land of telepathic giants and fairies called Thule. Right? We mentioned that. Uh, Himmler and most of the Nazis' brass, <laughs> they believed that Thule was the, was the origin you know, place the, uh, of the Aryans. It was, it was very real. If you send a team of men to Iceland, to find an entrance to a magical land of white power giants in fairies, you might be a Nazi. Holy shit, this happened. I need you to go to Iceland. I need you there yesterday. Carl is, sure, Carl is sure that there's a tunnel there that will lead you to the magic ice giants. Go now for the Fiora. Uh, if they could find the entrance to this place, believed to be accessible via secret code hidden in medieval Icelandic saga called the Eddas, then the Nazis believed, or at least some of them believed, that they might accelerate their Aryan breeding program. Right? They could get some, uh, uh, you know, good old pure Aryan stock from the fucking Thule Tunnel. <laughs> and then they could recover their supernatural powers of flight, telepathy, telekinesis, you know, that they believe their ancestors in Thule possessed, you know, all that stuff lost to the le breeding with the, the lesser races. God, this shit is so out there. I mean, think, think about this in the sense that they had meetings about this, right? A budget had to be proposed. Administrators eagerly awaiting to hear about, you know, what important giant-centric discoveries had occurred. So what, what news do you bring me today of the giants? Have, have you found any more of the caves in Iceland? Oh, that is fantastic. Oh, that is great news. Eichmann, Eichmann, did you hear about the caves? This is wonderful. The Fjord will be so happy. And what about the Aryan giants with the mind control powers and the ability to move the things with the white power mines and the flying and all of that stuff? <laughs> How epic uh, would it have been if they found the tunnel? They found Thule in Iceland. It did lead to a world of magical giants, but then, uh-oh, the giants were Jewish. And they were fucking pissed. I had to get that news back. Ah, oh, this is terrible news. Carl, I'm so peeved at you that you did not mention this in your teachings. This is the mother of all backfires, uh, Hitler. Hitler, we have, uh, we have found the giants. No, don't clap. Don't smile too much. Don't get too... Yes, they can fly. Yes, they're very magical. Yes, the mind control. Yes, all that stuff. But no, it's not happy. It's very sad. The thing is, if you're, the thing is, the, the ice giants, are, they are Jewish. Nine. No, not, not Aryan. Nine. Yes, do not, please, do not kill the messenger. 
Also, well, the, the Giants are quite furious about the Nazi speeches and, and the Nazi laws and the whole concentration camp thing. You might want to shave the mustache, maybe play hide and seek for some time. Uh, Nazis also, of course, obsessed with Atlantis, various legends that tied Atlantis myth to uh, Aryan origin myths. One of these myths, uh, a theory by religious scholar Hermann Wirth. Hermann, uh, he thought that he figured out why similar looking symbols could be found in different parts of the world, right? The answer, of course, is Atlantis. Worth proposed that survivors of a sinking Atlantis fled to places, high places, you know, vowed to avoid the sea that ruined their civilization initially. And that's how the descendants of Atlantis ended up in the mountains of Tibet. That's how they eventually morphed into yetis. All the pieces fit. They carried the ones. The numbers crunched out. Uh, during a Nazi Tibetan expedition in 1938-1939, Nazi scientists collected thousands of specimens while comparing locals to a list of facial features and concluded that they indeed had descended from the Aryans. I mean, they didn't, but whatever. Himmler and his anthropologists thought that by measuring people's uh, skulls, you could tell which race they were. Uh, you can't. Uh, declaring that they indeed had found out what happened to Atlantis was a big boost to the myth-fueled Nazi war machine. They became convinced the Tibetans were survivors of Atlantis. This hardened Himmler's views on racial purity. Right? The Aryans had dispersed around the world. They made it to places like Tibet and Germany. Uh, this expedition helped uh, him uh, towards his decision that the Aryan master race was now weaker due to intermixing, needed to be purified. Right? Cue the Holocaust. And obviously more went into the decision for the Holocaust than that, but it did play a part. Uh, there were other endeavors to link ancient people to the Atlanta, Atlantean Aryan myth. Similar efforts to find Aryans were dispatched to uh, Sweden, Scotland, France, Iceland. As I already mentioned, the Nazis believed that India also seeded by the Aryans. One German archaeologist, eventual SS commander Edmund Kiss, promoted the idea that Bolivia's famous historical site, uh, Tuanaku, a pre-Columbian site high in the Andes, roughly 200 miles from the Pacific Ocean, was Atlantis. Uh, okay. I, I thought Atlantis uh, was where the Atlantic Ocean is. I thought we went through this. Uh, not, now it's on the other side of South America and still a long ways from uh, the western coast of that continent. <laughs> it's, it's almost like this shit is gib gibberish. Uh, Commander Kiss believed in the elaborate and outlandish world ice theory, which had the support of Adolf Hitler. According to this theory, Earth at some point collided with the moon, and that led to the destruction of Atlantis and an ice age. Trying to survive their new glacier-filled reality, ancient Atlanteans believed, uh, were believed to have fled to the high Andes, where life could still survive somehow. What in the fuck? This provides such a great example of why science is so goddamn important, why education is so important. So the world doesn't end up being led by complete idiots who think that in the event of an ice age, when there's glaciers and the world is super cold, it somehow makes sense to move up in elevation, where it will, of course, be colder and more icier. Uh, Kiss's work found enthusiastic support in Germany. He wrote statements proclaiming that the works of art and the architectural style of the prehistoric city is probably the creation of Nordic men <laughs> who arrived in the Andean highlands as representatives of a special civilization. God damn it. Nazis published these findings in Hitler Youth Publications, other party newspapers, right? Great reminder of why the freedom of the press is so important so we're not being force-fed insane fucking gibberish that just serves the powers that be. Uh, Himmler sponsored another KISS expedition to Bolivia, but it never materialized due to the start of World War II. Uh, the Nazis also looked for an entrance into a possible hollow earth. Uh-huh. We covered hollow earth theory in an episode of the suck, an early one, number eight. And we talked about six U.S. president, John Quincy Adams, considering funding an expedition to look for mole people living in the center of the earth. The hollow earth theory, popular at various points in the 19th century, still considered possible by the Nazis, right? In the 20th century, still considered possible by some wackadoodles today, proposes that the planet earth is entirely hollow. Inside earth, there are oceans, an internal sky, an internal sun, mountains, all kinds of shit. Right? There's multiple variations of this theory. Some versions have a race of beings living down there. Some have multiple races living inside the earth, like fucking mole people, old Vikings, giants, reptile dudes, dudettes, Nazis. Some of the Nazis believe that the entrance to the hollow uh, earth was located in Antarctica. And some conspiracies today, uh, conspiracy, you know, theories, they, uh, or conspiracists, there we go. That's the word I like. Uh, today believe that the Nazis went down there, found the entrance, built a base, and now a bunch of them <laughs> live inside the hollow earth with the mole people and the lizards and all that shit. And spoiler alert, it's all true. <laughs> it's all real. Uh, no, of course it's a lie. The persistence of the Nazi ice fortress myth actually prompted Colin Summerhays, a marine geologist oceanographer at Cambridge, to take the step of publishing a peer-reviewed paper disproving the idea that the Nazis have an ice base that leads to the hollow earth in 2017. He did an academic study being like, fucking, you guys, stop it. 
Uh, why do conspiracists believe this stuff? Well, because of a legendary Nazi mission about how they went on an Antarctic expedition in 1938, 1939, when Karl Donitz, the guy who had become the president of the Nazis for about three weeks after Hitler killed himself before the Nazis surrendered, a man who was then a naval admiral did brag about witnessing an invulnerable fortress, a paradise-like paradise -like oasis in the middle of eternal ice. Well, following a meticulous look through Nazi records, Summerhays found no mention in any of the German documents of any intention to establish a base during the expedition, nor that any attempt was made to do so at any time afterwards. The expedition was only off the Antarctic coast uh, for a month, most of which was dedicated to mapping out this small area. Did Donitz claim he saw some mythical base? Yeah, he did, but there's not been any evidence to back up this claim. I'm guessing he was lying because he felt pressure to tell Hitler what Hitler wanted to hear, right? Or what Himmler wanted to hear. The Nazis believed in the possibility of even more weird shit they funded uh, research to explore, like tea leaf reading, dowsing, astrology, witchcraft. Himmler founded the SS Witches Division, which collected evidence in Eastern Europe that Teutonic, aka German wise women, the Teutons, uh, an ancient order of people generally classified as Germanic, uh, had been persecuted and burnt in what Himmler considered to be a Jewish Catholic Inquisition plot against German culture and blood. I fucking throws the, the Jewish people into the Inquisition. What the fuck? No, the Catholics did that. Come on. Uh, the Nazis even looked to the prophecies of Nostradamus for help in defeating, you know, the, the allies. We looked at Nostradamus way back in time, Suck 40. As the catalog grows, so did the connections. I love it. Hail Nimrod. Uh, 1939 propaganda master Joseph Goebbels set up late at night reading the prophecies of Nostradamus, which he revealed to an enthusiastic Fuhrer as evidence that the British were going to be defeated. The Nazis did even crazier shit. This next one is especially bananas and not uh, bananas in a super, super sexy kind of way. Uh, the British relied primarily on radar to find German U-boats. The German Navy decided to one-up them and use one of the members of the IOW, the Institute for Occult Warfare, Ludwig Straniak, a member of the Institute. He was a German mystic who was also a pendulum dowser, which is a thing I did not know about. Over a large map of the Atlantic Ocean, a one-inch model battleship was moved about. <laughs> this is all being witnessed by a bunch of like top Navy generals as Ludwig swings a metal diviner on a string above the map. While these, you know, these not, I guess be admirals, you know, like watching, if the pendulum dowsing device would react over the toy ship, this would of course indicate the presence of a genuine British battleship. The Nazis convinced themselves it was a totally normal thing to do and that it was how the British were finding their U-boats, which they were not. Uh, the Nazis also looked to astrology to help win the war. After Italy's dictator, Benito Mussolini, was toppled and arrested, Operation Mars was launched. Forty experienced astrologers, tarot card readers, magicians, and dowsers were released from concentration camps and installed in a via in Berlin's uh, Wannsee under the leadership of top magician Wilhelm Wolf. They were ordered to find out where Mussolini was being held prisoner. Uh-huh. Then a fucking team of magicians trying to find the Italian leader. It didn't work. Of course, it didn't work. Uh, <laughs> SS General Schellenberg would later complain, these magicians cost the SS a pretty penny. They demanded and they got huge quantities of luxury food, alcohol, and tobacco before they could even start to work. Uh, large map of Italy was unrolled. The pendulum dowsers would just fucking swing around the map in an attempt to you know, find the Italian dictator. In the end, SS commandos working with other Nazi troops did find Mussolini. They rescued him. Uh, the rescue had nothing to do with information put forth by these weird magicians. I just keep, I keep picturing like these ridiculous Nazi magicians, or I guess, you know, I guess they were in concentration camps. So they didn't, they didn't want to be part of this program, but these, these weird magicians saying stuff like, Allah, peanut butter sandwich, presto changeo, wacko smacko, I now pull Benito out of my hat -o. Go, God, God, give me, give me a second, Himmler. I must have, I must have said the words in the wrong order. Carl, why haven't the Nazi magicians found the Benito guy? This is also very disappointing. We don't find the ice giants. We don't find the magic Jesus cop. We don't find anything cool. Carl, have you not been taking your special good boy medicine, Carl? Carl, you rascal! That is why you talk about potatoes so much. This is so unfortunate. I've based my whole life on the teachings of a crazy person. Uh, so in conclusion, the Nazis believed in a lot of weird shit. More than the Holy Grail. More than we listed today. Uh, basically, they looked into, you know, anything they could think of, real or imagined, science-based or strictly folklore and legend-based that they thought could help them take over the world. And if they would have taken over the world, the scariest part to me about all this is they would have taught future generations that a lot of the shit they looked into was not wackadoodle and harebrained, it was science. 
Scariest thing I learned this week is how the Nazis rewrote history to incorporate so much of this crazy shit into this weird Aryan, Aryan origin story. It's not remotely true. Thank God the Nazis searched for the Holy Grail, Atlantis, Thule, Ice Giants, Spirit of Destiny, Aryan Yetis. All sorts of other crazy shit came to an end when they surrendered to Allied forces on May 7th, 1945, after Hitler killed himself, after he finally realized that the Aryans were not, in fact, supreme enough to keep the Americans, British, Russians, Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders, and more from kicking the fucking shit out of their evil regime. Also, I should say that while Himmler certainly was super into this stuff, there were other Nazis, Hitler and many other Nazi higher-ups, not fighting primarily because of a belief in some occult-based feeling of destiny. It was just part of a much bigger puzzle. Himmler didn't consult with old Karl quite as much as I joked about either. I'm sure uh, many, if not most of them, were fighting mostly because of nationalistic pride. They just wanted the same power that conquerors have craved throughout all of human history. But how weird, right? All this other strange context around it. How strange is the dedicated money to this stuff? What a good reminder that people in charge are not necessarily rational or sane or good people. Got to always keep an eye on the people running the government. Don't want to let a Hitler or Himmler type get too much power ever again. Uh, I hope all you meat sacks were as, as entertained by all of this as I was. And we live in a strange world. Let's take a look back at uh, the strangest we covered today in today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, a lot of people contributed to the ideals of the Aryan myth that arguably launched all this other Nazi tomfoolery, right? From the teachings of the 19th century Russian crackpot Madame Blavatsky of the Theosophical Society to other, you know, zealous and super racist archaeologists like, or archaeologists like Alfred Rosenberg to occult groups like the Thule Society and more, Hitler and Himmler didn't make this shit up. You know, these, these ideas uh, were, were put out there by uh, the teachings of other wackadoodles. Always watch out for wackadoodles. Number two, Heinrich Himmler was a fucking maniac. He believed in most of this stuff, possibly all of it. He had a castle prepared for the arrival of the Holy Grail. He wanted to popularize a new German religion based around Aryans having godlike powers. Number three, Himmler and other Nazis thought that ancient Aryans did have god powers and that mixing with other races ruined that. Holy shit. Number four, the Nazis before the war ended were starting to teach some of their rewritten history as real history. Aryans are not the supreme race because there is no Aryan race. There was just a big mixture of races that can all be traced back to being part of the same human race. All different shades of the same meat sack. Number five, more grail info. The search for the mythical Holy Grail has long fascinated humanity. Right? It continues to. Monty Python and the Holy Grail, 1975 British comedy classic. In the UK, readers of Total Film Magazine in 2000 ranked it as the fifth greatest comedy film of all time. Full of tons of memorable characters such as the Knights who say knee. We are the knights to say knee. Dan Brown's crazy popular book, The Da Vinci Code, also revolved around an interpretation of the Holy Grail, where this time the Grail is not a cup, but a tomb containing the bones of Mary Magdalene. And Mary Magdalene and Jesus were lovers, and their descendants are guarded by the Priory of Sion. Uh, another thing that's actually not real. Uh, the third Indiana Jones film, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, involves the Grail and Nazis in a castle. Indiana finds the Grail heals with it, uses its healing powers. I think if you watch or rewatch this movie after today's suck, you're going to get a lot more out of it. Uh, finally, people are still looking for the grail in real life, you know? Recently in 2014, some ding-dongs claimed to have found it. Two Spanish historians, Margarita Torres and Jose Ortega del Rio, claimed to have found the grail, identifying it as a 2,000-year-old vessel in a church in Lyon in northern Spain. The pair spent three years studying the history of the chalice and published a book, The Kings of the Grail, Making Their Case. The onyx chalice, they explained, was concealed within another antique vessel known as the Chalice of Donna Uruk, uh, Ruka, located in Lyon's Basilica of St. Isidore. And the historian said it had been there since the 11th century. He says this is a very important discovery because it helps solve a big puzzle, one of them told the Irish Times. We believe this could be the start of a wonderful stage of research. The duo had been researching the history of some Islamic remains in the St. Isidore Basilica, and then they discovered two medieval Egyptian documents that mentioned the chalice of Christ, or so they claim. The parchments told a tale of how Muslims took the sacred cup from the Christian community in Jerusalem to Cairo. It was then given to an emir on Spain's Mediterranean coast in return for help he gave the Egyptians who were suffering from a famine at the time. The historian's research even allegedly has been backed up by scientific dating. That's what they would claim. 
you know, estimating that the cup in question was made between 200, BC, 200 BCE and 100 CE, right? Fits the timeline. And then the scientists would admit, or these archaeologists would admit that the first 400 years of the cup's history would remain a mystery. They can't prove the chalice ever actually touched Christ's, Christ's lips, but they insist that there's no doubt this is the cup that Christians revere as the chalice used in the Last Supper, saying the only chalice that can be considered the chalice of Christ is that which made the journey to Cairo, and then from Cairo to Lyon, and that is this chalice. That's uh, what Torres said, who te he teaches medieval history at the University of Lyon. However, countless scientists and historians uh, who have pursued the Holy Grail, um, you know, uh, say that this is not true, right? Sounds cool, but medieval historians have been very quick to point out these guys are lying, reminding people that you can't find what doesn't exist. Again, no one even mentioned the Grail in 12th to 12th century. So, you know, despite this new cool story floating around on the web, when you really look into it, uh, most people think it's just uh, a forgery. Nice try, guys. The Nazis never found it, and neither did you. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The Nazi search for the Holy Grail sucked. Holy Atlantis. What the fool did we just explore? I hope you're entertained. No, no timeline in that one. It was a different kind of episode. I really enjoyed it. I hope you did. Uh, big thanks to the Time Suck team. Thanks to Queen of the Suck, Lindsay Comas. High Priestess of the Suck, Harmony Velikamp, Reverend Dr. Paisley. Big thanks to the Bit Elixir app design crew. Uh, more big thanks to the merch artist, formerly known as the Spicy Club, Access Apparel, and the script keeper, Zach Flannery. Uh, I thought Zach did a great job setting me up for this one to give me a lot of stuff to, to build on, really structuring it in a great way. Next week, uh, more Nazis. I know it's a lot for December, but while we're thinking about them, let's look into the tale of some real brave Jewish folk who fought the fuck back against the Nazis, the tale of the Warsaw Ghetto a tale based in actual truth. And it's inspiring uprising shortly after the German invasion of Poland in September, 1939. And yes, we're headed to Poland. I am sorry about that. Uh, more than 400,000 Jews in Warsaw, the capital city, were confined to an area of the city, little more than one square mile in size. In November, 1940, this Jewish ghetto was sealed off by brick walls, barbed wire, armed guards. Anyone caught leaving was shot on sight. The Nazis controlled the amount of food that was brought into the ghetto and life became hellish. But there was life. And there was still hope inside. From April 19th to May 16th, 1943, in the midst of World War II, residents of this Jewish ghetto staged an armed revolt, armed more with insane bravery than actual weapons to prevent deportations to Nazi-run extermination concentration camps. The Warsaw Uprising inspired many other revolts and extermination camps and ghettos throughout the German-occupied Eastern Europe, and we get to learn about it next week. And right now, we get to see what's cracking in the cult of the curious. Updates. Get your time sucker updates. Starting with the Killdozer update. Coming from time sucker Conan Rochel. Rochel? Rockel? I, I'm confident about the Connor part. Uh, Connor writes, Hello, master of all sucks, handler of Bojangles. This is a bit long, but I hope you can find the time to read it. My name is Connor Rochel. And my dad got me into Time Suck, and we've been listening to it ever since. Just finished the suck on Killdozer. I have lived in Colorado for almost my entire life and heard this story many times over. All different varieties and how it was viewed. After listening to this suck and hearing more of the fine details of how this whole situation developed and how it went down, I do feel some sympathy for Marvin due to how he uh, you know, got screwed over he got at times with the apartment complex, other deals he made. Uh, but since he didn't take the 500000 he got from the property and go on and have his good life, you know, since this uh, suck has opened a lot of views to his story and how he wasn't a hero, don't have any sympathy for what he ended up doing. Uh, one more thing, so I don't make this too long, and it's about the privacy on the shopping list you brought up during the interview. I agree with you that we should be monitored to an extent. I feel like certain things you buy online in high quantity, such as chemicals or explosive substances, should be reviewed. And people should be able to see if any other suspicious things are being bought. But at the same time, we should have our privacy to buy what we buy. Uh, like you said, this is a hard topic to talk about. The privacy in our lives is hard to figure out what is okay. Uh, when is it okay to intervene? When is it not okay? It's getting long now. Thank you for your hard work with these sucks. Help me get through some hard times. Hail Nimrod. Cheers, Connor. Uh, thanks, Connor. I'm glad you got some extra info out of the story about Marvin Heemeyer and the Killdozer situation. And yeah, and thanks for just uh, bringing up the the uh, you know that topic of privacy versus safety again. It is a tough one. I, I don't, I don't know. I still haven't heard anybody like give the answer that's like, yes, that's that's what we got to do. Exactly that. It really, really is tricky. But like you said, yes, yeah, certain certain things I do think should be like red flagged. 
You know, like if my neighbor <laughs> suddenly is, is buying the exact ingredients you would need to make like a ton, you know, 2000 pounds worth of, you know, pipe bombs. I, I would like him to be, you know, maybe someone's checking on him. Maybe someone's talking to him. And if he answers the door, you know, talking like Carl, it's, you, 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 it's, it's the ice giants. We got to <laughs> go boom, 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 <laughs> make it to the ice giants. And then we'll find, that's when the Aryans can fucking come out finally. You know, I, I would want that to be monitored, but also uh, do appreciate my privacy. Tricky, tricky, tricky. I uh, got a nice little shout out for Kickass Facebook moderator and Kickass Meat Sack. We love her here at Times like Liz Hernandez from Space Wizard Mike, who writes, Hey, damn suckins. If you read this and decided to put it in a Time Sucker update, of course, feel free to use whatever names and content you feel is appropriate. Don't want to upset anyone, but I was encouraged to throw this your way since you might enjoy it. Real quick, I want to thank you again for the gathering experience this summer. Had a wonderful time meeting you, your family, your team, and some of the awesome lizards. Speaking of awesome lizards, some of us have had a couple of group chats still going where we banter around and share our experiences. Those group chats happen to include our beloved Liz Hernandez. Earlier this evening, I sent a clip of Triumph the Insult Comic Dog making a hilarious cameo burn on David Tell from the crowd during one of the shows Dave was hosting a few years ago. Liz responded that she loves Triumph. Below is the conversation that followed. Liz, I love Triumph. Me. That should come as a surprise to no one. Wink. Liz, now what the fuck do you mean by that? Laugh my ass off. Me. You like roasting people in the joking sense. Hopefully not the real act of roasting people or else you're going to end up being an episode of Time Suck. After writing that, I, I immediately had some fan fiction time suck pop into my head, uh, hearing your voice along with the traditional music of the intro. Today, we're going to talk about Liz Hot Lunch Hernandez, former friend of the cult of the curious until her dark past was illuminated by the firelight she used on other victims. Small in stature, but not small in hunger, Liz used her wit and non-threatening appearance to lure her prey into the horrific demise of being roasted for her pleasure. We're going to be talking about how she turned humans into s'mores on the hot, well done, super crispy edition of Time Suck. Ah, I hope that made you uh, made you laugh, Mike. Hope you hope you like that. Oh, that was so nice. Thanks for uh, for writing and thanks for giving Liz a shout out. She is the best, and uh, I love Triumph the Insult Comic Dog as well. You sent in a nice message for him to poop on. Uh, Cummins Law update now coming in from Spaces or James Moore. Dear he who sucks on a high, I wanted to share an example of Cummins Law. I work overnight in a factory that builds jet engines. It's a loud, bordering on needing hearing protection environment where I always, uh, you know, wear, uh, you know, uh, hearing protection. A rule change required me to stop wearing headphones and use portable speakers to listen to things at work. Everyone works fairly alone. Huge machines are controlled by single operators. I have a reputation for people walking up and asking, what the fuck? I listen to podcasts, stand-up audiobooks, heavy metal, depending on my mood. The funniest uh, thing happened a few months ago when my supervisor, a very sweet lady who recently had her first grandchild, came to ask me a question about, uh, you know, something while I was listening to the Ed Kemper suck. She looked terrified. When I turned around, she tapped me on the shoulder. It was, uh, I turned around when she tapped me on the shoulder. It was right as you were explaining how she liked to, pl how he liked to pleasure himself with severed heads. <laughs> I no longer listen to serial killer sucks at work. 45 minutes commute, so I listen to them on drives to and from. Keep on sucking, master sucker. Well, sorry, James. I, uh, I, bet, I bet that was a little awkward to explain uh, some neck fucking to someone not in the cult. And I get why she probably told you, ah, no more of that. We're not going to be doing that out loud anymore. But I love hearing about it. Uh, awesome message coming in now from an anonymous sucker. Who writes, hey, Dan, just a quick positive message. Couldn't help but share. I'm a member of a very supportive and wonderful, albeit anonymous, online addiction support group. Recently, during a chat session, one of my friends in the group used the phrase, oh my heck. I took the chance and asked, time suck fan? And upon confirmation, a new space lizard bond was formed. I just wanted to share with you how happy it made me and hopefully him, uh, yes, it is a him, to find a fellow space lizard, even in the most random and niche corners of the world internet. It may seem silly, but especially as an addict, that small bond made me feel really, really good and connected to something bigger. If you wouldn't mind, please give a big shout out to my friend Fluge and wish Fluge a happy I-W-N-D-W-Y-T. I will not drink with you today. It would mean a lot for, to me and I hope him. Hail Nimrod, be gone Lucifina, and hail Fluge and the rest of the community for being my friends and being there for me even though we've never met. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Master Sucker. Uh, well, happy I will not drink with you today, Fluge. And thank you, uh, awesome Anonymous Meat Sack, for sending that message. I'm so glad you found a greater sense of community 
with, uh, with what we're doing here. Very happy about that. Now we got a shadow people update uh, from spooked sucker Andrew Wilson, who writes, Hail the August Lord of the Suck. To start, I'm usually not a superstitious person, but after hearing both updates and your time suck about shadow people, I'm a little freaked out. I wake up sometimes rather violently between the hours of 2 and 3 a.m., which I've just recently learned was referred to as the witching hour, and I've thought to have seen shadow silhouettes in corners of the room. Always figured it was just my imagination. Recently, though, an experience with one of those silhouettes has me disturbed. I woke up in the middle of the night from a terrible nightmare and saw next to me in my bed what I thought was my girlfriend, yeek, sitting up beside me. I kept looking at what I thought was my girlfriend for a couple seconds before asking her if she was okay, thinking I had scared her. Oh, boy. But when my girlfriend sleepily answered, she was laying on her side on the other side of the bed. Mind you, I have a California king. I turned towards the sound of my girlfriend's voice and then back towards the silhouette and it was gone. What's entirely unsettling is how the shape wasn't across the room and it couldn't have been mistaken for anything else. It was right next to me and extremely humanoid in figure. Uh, thank you kind of for sending that in Andrew Wilson uh, I did a little more research about shadow people and I wanted to pass this information along when you see a figure sitting next to you in bed like that you have no more than three days left to live so just enjoy what time you have uh, that thing's definitely going to kill you like for sure from everything I've read there's not a chance there's nothing you can do uh, next update <laughs> I, didn't read, I, fucking, I didn't read that Oh, that'd be, t- that'd be terrible if I did read that to pass that along. No, that's fucking scary as hell. And I hope that never happens to me and I hope it never happens to you again. Yeek. Now a thoughtful update. You should check out Scared to Death if you haven't though. If you, why not? You're already scared. Just get even more terrified. Listen to the other horror podcast. A thoughtful update now coming in from Born Again Sucker, Robert Griggs. Robert, I want to call him Bobbert. Now says, and this is the last update uh, for today. Dan, thank you, your family and your staff for taking the time to make this podcast. I've been a fan of your stand-up for quite some time and I was excited to find out that you had an informative podcast on the type of listener that starts at episode one. I made it to episode 71 and started to notice a slight decline in content, enough to make me take a break. I listened to a few other informative podcasts, but they were uh, just about as much fun as listening to someone read VCR instructions. I don't even know where you find VCR instructions now. Smithsonian maybe? Regardless, it took a break for a while. When I decided to try to re-engage, I scrolled through and saw episode 100, Drunk as Fuck Suck, of the Axemen of New Orleans. Wasn't sure what to expect, but I wasn't disappointed. I liked the unconventional nature of the episode. It, it was informative, but it was still a celebration. I appreciate that your guest co-host helped you uh, helped your drunk ass stay to- on topic just enough. Moreover, the discussion you and Lindsay had brought up uh, regarding the numerous bonus episodes and how taxing it had been, Uh, It made sense. The aforementioned slight decline was due to you working yourself to death. If I may weigh in, I would much rather have fewer, better episodes uh, that you're, that you are proud of rather than volumes of content that draws you closer and closer to hating the whole endeavor. I'm excited to reinvest in the cult of curious, appreciate the work you're doing even more. So now given the change of perspective, that level of honesty and vulnerability made me realize the humanity behind the product. I was consuming so casually apologize for being so flippant with something you're killing yourself to create. I still have a year and a half of catching up on insane ramblings coupled with well-researched information. I'm looking forward to it. Sincerely, Robert A. Griggs. Well, thank you, Robert, for sending that in. Um, yeah, you know, the, the show is tricky. It's a, it's a tricky uh, mix of, of business pressure, artistic interest that kind of makes it all run. You know, yeah, some, sometimes I think like, man, maybe it'd be kind of fun to like take weeks off here and there. That's hard to do because of uh, sponsors and because of staying top of mind and just kind of the business thing. There's a lot of content out there. And it, it is important to kind of like stay in people's ear holes if you don't want them to find, I guess, other products. And then honestly, I, I like the challenge of doing it every week. And I'm afraid that if I got away from a weekly format, that then I would hesitate too much, start to doubt things. Like if I didn't have that hard kind of, kind of quick deadline, then I would overthink every single episode. So I do, I do think the weekly thing is the way to go and I can still do it with other things. I, I've been working on, you know, really getting more efficient. It's so nice now that, that, that listeners have been supportive enough to, to help us on Patreon and spread the show so we can you know, get more advertisers, which then allows me to hire, hire a team and then train a team to, to help take a lot of the load off of my plates, which, which makes it possible to put out more content more constantly and, and not feel overwhelmed. I'm definitely staying up too late uh, here and there sometimes still, but, but getting better, it's getting more... Uh, it's less frequent than it used to be easily. And I think it's going to get even more less frequent this next year. And, and I am getting more uh, passionate about this because I sense it too. I, I don't want to burn out doing something like this and make the thing I love, the thing I hate. 
so yeah, so so that was that was nice for kind of me to reflect on because you sent that message, and I'm glad you you noticed that, you know uh, did try to kick up the quality, not be burnt out, and then and then also you know it is I will just say it's going to bounce around just human nature, you know I'm not a robot either, so you know there's going to be weeks yeah where I'm more tired than other weeks, I have more going on in my life, uh, I'm going to be naturally more interested in certain subjects than the others, uh, but I do definitely try and just you know put as much passion as I can into this every single week, and I love doing it every week. So thanks, thanks to you and, and all of you for listening every week. Thanks for appreciating what we do here. I know there's a lot of other things you, you could choose to listen to. So thanks for, uh, for not fucking doing that. Hail Nimrod, you guys. Love it. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. So I hope to have a great week, everyone. I'll talk to some of you uh, later tomorrow night if it's scared to death. I, I talk to space lizards on Thursday. Uh, don't waste time looking for the soul giants or Atlantis or the alien Sasquatches. As Carl did not help me find them at all. It's very frustrating. I think I think you should just focus on keeping on it with the sucking most of all. Oh. Dan, Dan, Dan. What? We, we you found it. it? We found it. Look. Oh, look at what we found. We found the holy. We have found the holy grail after all this time. Look authentic. It's so authentic. Look at it, Carl. You did such a great job. I'm so proud of you.